Welcome back to episode 129 of the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast. My name is Josh. As always, I'm here with Troy. What's going on, Troy? Not a whole lot. Just got done with work. We're recording early, thank God, and then it's off to hockey practice. Yeah, our normal mode lately has been to record in the wee hours of the night, but <laughs> we're going a little bit earlier tonight, so I might actually get to bed at a decent hour, which is never a bad thing. Kind of a couple of gloomy days here in Minnesota. When was the last time we saw the sun? Supposed to snow this weekend. Oh, great. Thank <laughs> you for that. Well, and you've got some big news in your house, too. You uh, added, what, a, a new driver this week? Oh, yeah. Daughter passed her driver's license test, so she is good to go. Just getting her added to the insurance, which should be by today or tomorrow, and then she can go on her own. Yeah, then she'll move out. So that'd be yeah. cool. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> Freedom, I'm out of here. Uh, that is, uh, that's kind of weird when that happened. I've been through that as well. Uh, big news on our end here. I uh, got to be a proud dad for a second. So my son heard back on a lot of, I think it's about the, this time of year when kids, uh, he's a senior. So he applied yeah. to a bunch of colleges. So he heard back from all the colleges he applied to. And very thankfully he got, he applied to three and got into all three, but most importantly, and this was very, very unexpected. He applied to the University of Minnesota, of course, for the boat, go Gophers, Sky mm-hmm. Uman. And he was accepted, Troy, into the Carlson School of Management as an incoming freshman. Nice. It's not super easy to do, to, to get in. So very proud of him. And congrats to my boy Sam for that big accomplishment. Uh, we have a big show today. We've, uh, we're pretty hard on it. So I'm pretty excited to share a bunch of the information that we have for you guys. Really quickly, though, before we get started, just a reminder that the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast is a Patreon podcast. That means we rely on support from listeners like yourself to help us cover our show expenses, produce more, and, well, hopefully better hockey card content and help us to fund initiatives, even in a small way, to grow the hockey hobby. You can join our out of $199 support level tier on Patreon. It starts at $5 a month. Not only do you support our show, but you get access to our Discord server where you can chat with there's 150 or so people in there mm-hmm. now and chat on a daily basis. It's become a really fun community of like-minded people and hockey collectors. And so I really enjoy the people in there. We do kind of fun stuff like fantasy hockey, 5k challenge, all that sort of stuff. It's very easy to do. You can go to our website, hockeycardsgongshow.com and click on the become a patron link at the top of the page. If you want to just go to the Patreon website, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com and search for hockey cards gong show. You can do that. If you're listening on a podcast app, there's a link in the show description. If you're watching us on YouTube, there's a link in the description there, too. And finally, in our Instagram and TikTok profiles, we have links via our link tree there as well. So, Troy, we have one new on a 199 member, um, Maxim LeBeau, that uh, signed up since our last show. So very thank you very, very much. Very grateful for, for your support. This isn't like some one of your relatives Reed. No, I know because you're a LeBeau or your wife is married, or somehow you're really wife is married to a LeBeau. There you go. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll find out. We're well, it's not my it's my white brother in law's long lost cousin, and yeah, you can do like an emotional tear jerking family reunion or something like that. Well, it's funny great. you're you're talking about fantasy hockey, and I just had this thought in my head. So, the first week of games, or our first game is done, and I won barely. And I swear, I'm I was great. like actively managing my roster making sure i had everyone play it and my opponent i think there's a couple times he didn't like play a person that was playing that day when he cut him and i barely still won so that just shows you how bad i am at fantasy hockey yeah i don't i think i'm one and one or one no i won i'm in a couple we won one game one i want to know in our league but uh i'm not it's hard to remember but it's nice that you can like do your roster out for a long period yeah. of time, but we have so much going on. It's hard to keep tabs yeah, up. I'm so sure, and I'm I, sure everyone likes to listen about our <laughs> fantasy sports, but all right, here's, here we go. I'm going to read the game plan. Okay, go ahead. On today's show, you get with the almost greatest player to wear number 29 and Josh, it's a fun one. Then it's off to another rookie deep dive segment. Next, we look at hobby news followed by a, my card post update with Mark Hill. We just, Ended up wrapping the interview. Lots of awesome information. Next, we take a look at some of our favorite hockey cards in the current PWCC weekly auction. This is followed by a first look at 
outburst parallel values in the recently released 2324 series one. Josh did a lot of digging, a lot of cool graphics. I can't wait for that. And then we end the show, as always, most of the time with personal pickups. It's kind of a goalie show today. It is. I just got, I noticed that when I was, I don't know, I was looking through the outline a little bit ago. Yeah, we got a lot of goalie stuff. So, all right, a brief primer again. We ran through the hockey writers' greatest NHL players to wear each number article on previous episodes. We are now looking at the runners up, and the player we go over has the title of almost greatest NHL player to wear that number that corresponds with our episode number. We are on episode 129, so I will be looking at the almost greatest player to wear number 29. Using the same article as before, which is the greatest NHL player to wear each number article by the hockey writers. But now I get to pick the player from the runners up list. So, Josh, the almost greatest NHL player to wear number 29 per the nominees in the hockey writers greatest NHL player to wear each number article is and selected by me is this guy, Mark Andre Fleury. Our guy, I guess I should say he's on our team. Did he dye his hair black there? I have no clue. I just, this is a great picture. This is like this picture. I have another one too, but this one like represents Flurry's personality. And I'll yeah. get it. He's always known as happy, go lucky. Additional nominees at number 29 were Josh would be mad that I didn't do this one Jason Pominville and Nathan McKinnon. So Pominville, our favorite wild, <laughs> that was always underperformed. Yeah, stick a pin in that for one second. I'll let you finish your sentence. <laughs> All right. As a reminder, the greatest award number 29 was Ken Dryden. Jason Pominville, are you, is this like a joke? <laughs> That's what they had. Dryden was the winner. The runners up were Flurry, Pominville, McKinnon. Now, was I didn't really follow before he got to Minnesota, but was Pominville all that much better in Buffalo? I thought or? so. I thought, I thought he came in with a good amount of hype when we got him, but. Because that was in like the heyday when we were like going to a lot of games when we had season tickets. Mm -hmm. And there's <laughs> there's remember. underwhelmed, whelmed, yeah. and overwhelmed. <laughs> and I was definitely underwhelmed by Severely Jason Pominville. Underwhelmed. Yeah, I agree with you. All right, let's get back to Fleury. Okay. Overview. He is a goalie from Sorel, Quebec. Fleury was the first overall pick in the 2003 NHL entry draft by the Pittsburgh Penguins. Okay, so Sorel, is that where the boots are made? You would think so, but I do not know. Okay. I'm going to go with, we'll, we'll go with that they're made there. Now I have another question. Yes. There can't be a super long list of goalies. Oh, that the first oh don't, don't, okay, okay, don't okay, okay, jump okay. the gun. We got fun facts. Right, jump the gun. <laughs> I think. Jump the gun. Sorry. I'm pretty sure I put it there. Flurry has played in 987 regular season NHL games over a 20 season NHL career. I thought that number was pretty low, but this is the age of managing goalies, and he probably sure. hit right at the beginning of that. So I because Brodeur played like what sixteen hundred games. Yeah, Brodeur had a bunch, I think. Wah had a bunch. Yeah. Oh, and I forgot to mention, most people do know this, but just a reminder: Flurry is still playing in the NHL, so those games played number. He should, well, he should get to a thousand <laughs> this year. He should if he if he plays like he did in Montreal, go for it, but. He should get enough starts. He'll get 13 get. more starts. I, you never know what the wild man yeah, injury yeah. or we got goalie of the or world goalie beater in waiting in the HL with. Wallstead. Oh, well, we're going to get to that. There's some development there <laughs> on the what, so, on the Jesper Wallstead front. So don't you. Yeah. Worry. So, some, so we got that. There. All right. Flurry began his career playing 13 seasons with the Pittsburgh Penguins. He then played for four seasons with the Vegas Golden Knights. Next, he had a 45-game stint with the Blackhawks before being traded to his current team, which is our Minnesota Wild, on March 21st, 2022. We could talk about that, how we were all excited. And I, do you think it's worked out? Has it worked out? I'm not sure. I don't want to get yeah, into okay, a long so discussion. I, I don't about know it, if this <laughs> is the right time to ask this question, yeah. but the number one question I want to ask you in this whole segment is, has this guy grown on you at all? Because I... I, I, here's my well before you answer i my take is you like him as a personality yeah but like as a goalie and the, like as, as you're a student of the goalie game not so much and I, well i think at his the point of his career i think the game's gotten too fast for him or it's it's passing him by and he's near the tail end 
But okay. that's just me personally. He's a he's a great goalie. Don't get so you're all, you're all aboard the Gus bus at this point. I'm all aboard the Gus bus with Flurry getting spot starts. Okay. Until Flurry shows me he can play like every game against Montreal, then he's then he's in. All right. For his awards and accomplishments, three time Cup winner, one time Vesna winner, one time Jennings winner, one time NHL second All Star team selection, five time NHL All Star game selection. He's a member of the 2010s All-Decade First Team that was put up, put out by the NHL. He is number 100 on the Athletics' best 100 players in modern NHL history. Mm. So he's the he's the bookend of the that bookend. list. The bookend. For his career, Fleury has 545 wins, which is third all-time and six wins behind tying Patrick Waugh for number two, just get ready. That's all you'll hear about when he plays about 50 times. How many yeah. more wins he needs to tie and pass walk. He has 316 career losses, 91 ties slash overtime losses, 2.5 goals against average, 0.913 save percentage, and 73 shutouts, which is 12th all time. Flurry has made the playoffs in 17 of his 20 NHL seasons, compiling nine, sorry, 92 wins, 74 losses, 2.56 goals against average, 0.911 save percentage, and 16 shutouts in 169 NHL playoff games played. Boy, you don't get much closer between your playoff stats and your yeah, no career regular season stats. So he's dead on, basically. All right. Best season of his NHL career was his 2020-21 season with Vegas, where Flurry had 26 wins, 10 losses, a 1.98 goals against average, 0.928 save percentage, and six shutouts in 36 games played. This season culminated with Flurry winning the Vesna and Jennings Trophy. Remember, this was a shortened season, and Flurry did have some definite good years in 2008-09, 2015-16, and 2016-17 seasons where he won cups with the Penguins. But I landed on the shortened one because the stats were better and he won the Vesna. So I just defaulted Okay, that. so I have another question just yeah. about, like a big picture question about this guy. Now, a lot of like, you know, he's coming up on Patrick Waugh and it's a huge accomplishment to be basically second all-time in wins if he yeah. does get there and eclipse him. Sometimes though, these records are a, a more or have something to do with the fact that we know Fleury has is in impeccable shape for a 38 year old. Yeah. That's one of the, he's really has taken care of himself. And so I just wonder at times, like how good of a goal, like it, at his best, how good of a goalie was he? Where oh, I, I know he's at the end of his career now. Like would you put him up there as an all time great when he like at the peak of his game? I mean, personally, I think so. But I, like I said, I've never seen, I didn't see all these other guys that you would besides Hashik, Wah. But Fleury is kind of in that Hashek mold where he would just he kind of buck the mold with what everyone was doing. He didn't stick to like one style. Yeah. You it would not be surprising to see Fleury even today pull out the double pad stack. When's the last time you saw the double pad stack? Probably Fleury in his last game or something. But yes, he was an athletic machine. I do think he's he's in the conversation as one of the okay. not maybe not the bet, maybe not the top three, but maybe top ten. He's for not having played a lot of, you know, over a thousand games, he's got a lot of wins. He's got really good numbers. He's played on definitely some good teams, but he's definitely in the conversation. He's so well, you have player. to be good to be yeah. at the, no matter how long you played, have the second most wins all time. Yeah, exactly. but then you also have to be in good. But your team is a big factor, and then as a goalie too. Oh right? yeah, yeah. It's all less. You could. There's a hundred things that go into this bucket, and <laughs> hopefully you get them all being good that you can. Uh, end up with a career like Fleury's. I would definitely take him. All right, Fleury is known as one of the best teammates in the NHL. I honestly don't think I've ever heard a story of a teammate not liking Mark andre Fleury. He's known for being super friendly, but also being a constant prankster that is always playing practical jokes on his teammates. He is notorious for cutting skate laces or hiding in teammates' bags to scare them. There are just Google Mark Andre Fleury pranks, and there are many articles you can find. Those were two. There's probably 15 different things he's done that are pretty funny. Yeah. As a goalie, 
Fleury, this is right to your point. Flurry is a true athlete and is always making some type of acrobatic save, even though he drives me nuts half the time because he looks behind him <laughs> more than ever on shots to see if they went in the net. But he never gives up on a shot. He studies shooters. He knows each shooter's tendencies. Again, he drives me crazy, but at least you can say there's never a dull moment with Flurry in the net. I think my favorite thing last year was when he tried to fight, was it Jordan Bennington with St. Louis? when there was a scrum and Flurry skated down and wanted to drop the gloves with him and the refs wouldn't let him. That's yeah. baloney. Th- those refs yeah, that was be sad. ashamed of themselves for robbing us of that beautiful... Why do, why do I think Flurry just like would get all that French rage and just beat the living? <laughs> French rage? Is that a thing? I, I don't know. Okay. I just, I I'll just go with it. You, I'll, I'll go with it too. I think you I think would have won, but that's me. All right. As we talked about on last show, this might be Flurry's last year. He's had a great career. Hopefully he still has some magic left in him for the wild, but it seems like all signs are kind of pointing either this year's the last, maybe next year, unless he wants to go like a complete backup route. He could probably yeah. stay on three to four more years. But like I said before, I hope he goes into broadcasting, coaching, management, somewhere where he's involved in the game still. Okay, you're showing a picture on YouTube in the yeah. Wilds reverse retro uniforms, yep. which are totally amazing. Look at his stick. Yeah, <laughs> he doesn't need tape his stick, huh? No, it's it's green tape. I can you can see it uh, if you look oh, close enough. Oh, really? Yeah, it looks that, it looks that, fantastic. That, that stick is amazing. Yeah, it, it's a really good picture. All right, fun, interesting facts for our boy. Why does Flurry wear number twenty nine? Well, he answered this. In juniors, there was three goalie jerseys, and I was the youngest guy there. So I had no choice, so they gave it to me, Flurry said. <laughs> so that's that's one of my favorites here. Just take this number and wear it the rest of your career. Thanks. Nickname is The Flower. I think most people know that. It's a literal translation of his last name. Flurry is the last active goalie to have played in the NHL before the 2004-05 lockout. Wow. And then finally, Fleury is only the third goalie to be chosen first overall in the NHL draft. After, and I don't know if it's Michael or Michelle Plazzi or Plazzi. I, I'll get yelled at. I'm sure I should know who he is. And Rick DiPietro. I do know that one. Do you imagine a goalie getting picked number one? I honestly don't think again? it will ever happen again in today's game. Unless the game changes. I was going to lean that way too. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think it's happening. If there's... There's just too much we know about goalies now. All right, for Flurry, his rookie card, 2003-04, upper deck, number 234, Young Guns. PSA 10 has a pop of 40 with a gem rate of 14%. So you're pretty safe if you attain a copy of this card. That that pop is going to stay right there, and probably the gem rate is going to stay right at 14%. Last sale that I could find was on December 4th of last year, 2022, via PWCC weekly auction for 1740 US dollars, which actually seems pretty cheap to me. All-time yeah. high sale I could find was on April 11th, 2022, via eBay and verified in Terapeak for 4300 USD, which is crazy. That's only, what, eight months? And it went from 4300 to 1740 Yeah, it just shows any given day, right? Yep. You got to have the right couple people compete and low pop card and things get out of control in a hurry. Yep. That's what we got. That's our boy, Mark andre Fleury. Let's keep on the goalie theme here, Troy. All right. We'll go into rookie, back into rookie deep dive. So we're another okay. edition on today's show. We're still focusing on rookies that are featured as young guns in the recently released 2023, 24 series one set. Like we always do. We throw up four choices on an Instagram poll and give you guys the opportunity to pick which rookie you want us to deep dive on the episode. Uh, We'll get into those in a second, but a little bit of housekeeping. Troy loves when I list, go through the list of everyone (laughs) I've done. I'm only going to do the series one rookies that we've covered to this point. We did Matthew Nyes in episode 80. Luke Hughes, episode 84. Then we took a big hiatus. Hiatus. And did Devin Levi in episode 125, and then Matthew Coronado in episode 127. So this week's candidates are <coughs> Justin Wolf, 
are Minnesota Wild defenseman Brock Faber, Simon Edvinson, then another goalie, Yaroslav Askarov. And we have the results here. We have the results. A little surprised by that. Maybe I shouldn't have been, but uh, I am too. I'm actually too. I thought I thought it'd be well, I thought it'd be Faber or Askarov. Askarov just it seems like he's getting a lot of hype, and I don't really understand why, but that's just me. So the winner winner chicken dinner was Dustin Wolf at forty yep. percent of the vote, followed by Brock Faber at twenty eight percent, and then Yaroslav Askarov at seventeen percent, and then coming in last was Simon Edvinson at sixteen percent. So that makes Dustin Wolf this week's rookie deep dive. So we're gonna learn some more about him. 22 years old, hails from Gilroy, California. Oh, he's American. Sweet. American. Gilroy is south of San Jose. (laughs) It's like to call it San Jose. So this is funny. Now, I pulled this directly from Wikipedia. I I know exactly where you're going. I cannot wait for your reaction. (laughs) So I'm almost going to read it from Batum. At six foot and 175 pounds. He's extremely undersized <laughs> for an NHL. Can they use the words extremely undersized? It's yeah. Like, that's not like a small person, but is I it getting that not. bad in the goalie community where you have to be a giant in order to be like, it's like an NFL quarterback now. It is. It's that's the thing. And it's funny. If you read any analysis preview, anything on Dustin Wolf, his size is always the thing that comes up as a knock. And when they say six feet, really, it's probably five eleven. Yeah. They always add a couple inches. Now you put him on skates, he's probably six one. So that helps sure. a little bit, but that doesn't help your arms and <laughs> get longer or anything like that. But yeah, I mean, I'm telling you, it, it used to be you had to be over six feet, or you had to be six feet or over. It's getting up to the six two now. Now now six feet is extremely undersized, quote unquote. Well, yeah, and like I talked about this a long time ago on our show. There's actually a school of thought now thinking why goalies are getting like scoring rates are going up is because we're automatically discrediting a pool of goalies that might be really good NHL goalies because of their height. And it's that makes sense. Them, yeah. They won't even look at them. All right. I'm going to counterbalance the extremely undersized. Okay. I have a banger for you right out of the gate. <laughs> right, in his last it. four seasons, he's been named goaltender of the year in the respective leagues he's played in. So twice for the Everett silver tips in the WHL yep. once for the Stockton heat in the, AHL and then once for Calgary Wranglers in the AHL. So that's uh, pretty good. Last four seasons named goalie of the year. And not too bad for the 214th overall pick in the 2019 NHL entry draft by the Calgary Flames. Now, Troy, this is going to get emotional. Well, now I'm, cha- I'm, I'm changing the list we use for the greatest numbers now. <laughs> in September, the hockey writers named Wolf the number one Whatever. NHL goalie prospect <laughs> ahead of Devin Levi at number two. And then shockingly, unex- inexplicably, <laughs> our guy Jesper Wallstead at number three, who all we've been told is like the greatest goalies yep. since goalies were created. <laughs> he has a precipitous fall from Ooh. number one with a bullet now to number three. Looking up at both Devin Levi and Dustin Wolf here. So what happened, Troy? Are, I don't should know. we be worried as Wild fans? I don't think so. We're, we'll be okay. It's a goalie. Probably a bad game when they wrote this article. Well, I had to do some digging, and the hockey writers have pointed out that Wallstead was like incredibly dominant, I guess, in the SHL, which would be the Swedish Hockey League, and then came over to the HL, and then was not quite as dominant good fine but didn't rip it up like uh, dustin wolf did here so wolf finished his whl career pretty insane numbers troy listen to this 106 wins 0.935 save percentage 1.84 goals against average 24 shutouts and 124 games i would take that I will say this too. I've been reading a lot of articles recently on how the WHL is now the premier league in, wow. you know, whatever the Canadian hockey league, how it's becoming the best in the world for that age group of players. Really? So that's not a small feat that he accomplished there. He finished the 2022 campaign as the CHL goalie of the year. So that's a, 
big deal, covering all three leagues. And in 2021, with the AHL Stockton Heat, he went 33-9-4, 2.35 goals against, 0.924 save percentage. Then he followed that up the next year in the AHL with the Everett Silvertips, where he was had an extremely impressive 42-10-2. That's crazy. Is this like Calgary? Nine goals against and 0.932 save percentage. Is this like Calgary can't figure out where to send him or they keep loaning him or how, why does he end up uh, in a different AHL team every year? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I didn't have time to look it up, but I was like, <laughs> yeah, because they have um, their own AHL team, right? So why wouldn't he play for the Calgary Wranglers? I don't, sometimes they loan him. I think it's oh. like a playing time issue or things like that. He ended up playing one game in April for the Flames at the NHL level. He allowed one goal. And a win with a end up with a point nine five eight save percentage, which is why he's a 2023 20, 24 series one young gun because he was that holdover rookie as having played in that one game last spring. And he started this season back at the Calgary Wranglers and in three games played so far as three and oh, three point two seven goals against point nine one oh save. So is it over? Is he suck now or what? Three, yeah. you know, gets the wins though, right? He gets the wins. So in reading more about him, due to his smaller than average size, Wolf plays more an upright style than is typical for modern goaltenders. Does that make sense to you? Yep. He has received praise for his high skill in lateral movement and positioning, as well as his quick reflexes. Well, he better do all those things if he's on a, the smaller side. He yeah. needs to be in the right position. He needs to take away the angle, get good depth, and with him, he probably can't play as deep as the big guys. So if there's rebounds and stuff, he's got to fly and be quick and react a lot faster than the big monsters out there right now. The Ben Bishops of the world. There you go. Wolf is noted for his warm up routine at the start of each period, which is concluded by a vertical jump. Have you seen that before? I have. It's crazy how high he gets. <laughs> it's almost scary. Yeah. I would slip and fall and <laughs> break my neck, probably. So and he's been doing this ever this routine since he joined the Everett Silver Tips. What's up with all these young goalies and their kind of cool routines? <laughs> we have Jedi Masters. We have vertical jumpers. What's going on? Are they teaching this in youth now that you have to have like some sort of like flash or flare to stand out as a goalie? Well, the big the big thing is the goalies are always the weird ones, right? There's always yeah. some little tick or something. They're always the goofy ones, so that's probably where it's coming from. But no, I don't think they're teaching that. I teach a goalie when he lets up to goal to figure out something to do, like skate to the boards or you know, bang the post with your stick, something to reset yourself, like an air in baseball, slap your glove. Teach him to skate over to the glass and start yelling at somebody in the stands. <laughs> hey, I've I've said this before I show the University of Denver when we I was going to go for games and like I think it was it was either late eighties, early nineties, they had a goalie. His last name was Walla Heimo. He was from Scandinavia. He was the greatest goalie I ever saw because he didn't. He would make a save, turn immediately around to the Gopher student section, and start taunting him, and that's all yeah. he did all game. He was the greatest ever. I loved watching him play. A little bit of a log jam right now in Calgary as far as the goalie position. So yeah. you have Jacob Markstrom is clearly still the number one guy, and then it sounds like in a couple articles that I found that. The Flames might be looking to move Dan Vladar to make room for Wolf. He would seem like that that would be probably the move, right? Yeah. Um, he's the number one prospect. So at one point, I think you had put Vladar on your goalies to watch. List. It doesn't seem like it panned out real well for him no. in that regard. Dustin Wolf is a 2023-24 Series 1 Young Guns, number 210. Last five raw sales averaging $14.60. Pretty cool picture. I like mm -hmm. that for, for goalie. I have to show you this one too, Troy, and, and I want your opinion on it. So here's this Young Guns canvas. Do you like this uh, image and style for a goalie card? Well, yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, I know who it is, obviously, with the name, but doing the splits and whatever's on the back of his helmet, it's pretty cool. So I last five... Do you think the value's hurt because it's like doesn't have his face? Or no, last five sales on his young guns canvas are averaging 23-28. Oh, wow. Now. Good for that. You know what I think I've noticed, though, is that I feel this this could be wrong, but 
just in looking at these releases for like five flagship releases in a row very, very closely, I feel like actually Canvas have higher values out of the gate hmm. than the base Young Guns, but then within six months, that's totally flip flop. But maybe we'll have to put that on the list of things to explore. Mm-hmm. So that's Dustin Wolf. Looks like uh, an art guy, Jesper Wallstead, is just. <laughs> falling into obscurity in the goalie yeah, prospect. I forgot about it, yes. Whatever. All right, we got to make a quick mention for Gong Show Partner and Sponsor Slab Sharks. Thank them very, very much for their support of our show. Reminder, the current Slab Sharks weekly eBay auction ends tonight. Be sure to head to slabsharks.com for a link to the auction. Place your bids. There's always tons of amazing hockey cards in their auctions, whether you bid in time for this week's auction or have to catch next week's. And honestly, Troy, they just keep getting better and better. If you're a Canadian hockey card collector or looking to maybe fund your next PC item or just want to move some cards for quick cash, Troy and I would recommend considering Slabshark's eBay consignment services. They make it very easy to sell your cards because, while well, they do all the work. They have the expertise, the systems, the equipment necessary to make your listings look awesome, take great photos, all that good stuff are accurate, and then they handle all the issues. It's kind of like Troy was thinking today. It's like having like a selling butler. Like Ask there. Jeeves? Yeah, like, you go, Jeeves, <laughs> oh, Jeeves, this buyer has an issue with the package sent. Would you mind taking care of it for me, please? And they just, Slab Sharks just takes care of it. It's pretty awesome. It's basically what they do. So for complete consignment information, including payout rates, and to get started consigning your cards today, head to slabsharks.com. Happy news. Happy news. Oh, boy. Yeah. PG. This is PG-13 warning if you're watching YouTube. Well, it's kind of like the Halloween theme. Right. Oh yeah, there you go. We got to do an N- NHL injury update. Haven't done one of these yet. It's always kind of the bummer of following any sports league or collecting. First one's kind of a big one, of course. Most people know Connor McDavid expected to miss one to two weeks with an upper body injury that occurred last Saturday night in the Oilers' three to two win over the Winnipeg Jets. Through five games, McDavid has two goals, six assists for eight points. So Troy. What do you think Edmonton needs more right now? A healthy McDavid or a good goalie? Goalie. They need a goalie, I think. I'm going to laugh when they win more than they lose with McDavid out. It's going to be the Ewing theory. If you ever listen to Bill Simmons, yeah, he always talks about how Patrick Ewing, when he was out, the Knicks actually won more because they didn't run the whole offense through, through Ewing. And I'm not a basketball guy, so I, I didn't know basketball at all. But this is one of those things that's going to be like a case study and see what happens. But, yeah, they're struggling. They're the biggest disappointment, I think, so far in the NHL. By well, the far. Wild worked them last night. Yeah, seven, seven goals. to four. Yeah. I don't know how much more you can put Jack Campbell out there. I know. If he was our goalie, I don't think I would watch any of those games. No, they were. There were some rough goals. I, you know, yeah. I don't want to get. Well, let's talk about some better news real quick. Andre Svechnikov for the Carolina Hurricanes is looking – to be close to 100%. He's been a full go at practice for the Canes and could make his 2023-24 season debut tonight. Now, I don't know if you call this, it's still early. They're three and four, almost 500, but they're kind of the bee's knees and a lot of pundits' eyes <laughs> to win the Stanley Cup this year. Yeah. And so I'm sure that they could use his presence in the lineup. Remember, he tore his ACL last yep. spring, so he's been out for a while, but good to have him back. On the uh, Connor Bedard front, Troy, Taylor Hall, the Blackhawks forward, was put on injured reserve after aggravating a shoulder injury on Saturday night versus the Golden Knights. He had originally sustained the injury in the Hawks' second game of the year on October 11th versus the Bruins. So it seems like it's a little wait and see right now as to how long he'll be out. Now, like I mentioned, Taylor Hall is not like very hobby relevant to this point, but he is that veteran presence that... Chicago really wanted to have paired up with Bedard. And it looks like as they've sort of shuffled the lines in his absence that right now, Taylor Johnson and Nick Foligno have been playing with Bedard since. And yeah, he got Bedard got bit by the offsides. The epidemic offside guy. review. I, I even texted him like Bedard scored. Oh, it was great. And then I'm like, oh, under review. And then, oh, didn't count. <laughs> no, we didn't. And then a little bit on the Homer take. I do. This happened a little bit ago, but we didn't mention it. In the wild second game, Matt Boldy, who was one of the bigger 2022-23 rookies, 
remains out with upper body injury. He's skating, I guess. So that's a good sign, sort of. But then his status is when the status is week to week. I don't love that. Yeah, um, we're all week to week or day to day. I don't know now. Who needs uh, Boldy more to be uh, playing and playing well? The Wild or the Hobby? Probably the Wild. Yeah, the wild but too. both could use him back ASAP. Like I said, he only played two games, had a goal and one assist in the in those games. So we didn't talk about the Frozen Frenzy much before. This is a little bit of a call this a Frozen Frenzy review <laughs> and critique, maybe. But uh, so a couple of days ago now. The NHL had their frozen frenzy where, of course, all 32 teams played on the same night. Yep. The game starts were staggered. So kind of trying to give fans a chance to see maybe even a little bit of every game, I think mainly here in the U.S. It seems like the NHL Troy tried to plan this hard for a night where there wasn't like an NFL game or anything going on. And um, I don't know. I just felt like it was pretty like random, but. On a Tuesday, wouldn't you like this so much better on a, like a Friday night? I I was thinking about that. I would like it on a weekend. You got to stay away from Saturday and Sunday though, because football will just kill you. And unless you have this in February, probably. But maybe Friday night. But I don't know. I don't. Is basketball even start? I don't know. NBA going? That's what started last night with two games, and in, in, or on Tuesday night, and then in earnest on Wednesday night, I believe. Yeah, I'm guessing this is the date they looked at. And I don't know if they're going to do this more as the season. Are they going to have another Frozen Frenzy night? But I get why they did it. They're just trying to get away from everyone else, and it seemed seemed like it worked. But isn't that kind of maybe out like smarting yourself a little bit in that if you pick a game where no other league has games on, wouldn't part of you assume that no other league has games on that day for a reason? Mm-hmm. It's not a good day to have games. I mean, I don't know. And, well, and not, I mean, if basketball just started, right? They're just not yeah. in their season, and everyone else's baseball's in postseason. And, football never plays on Tuesday. And I don't want to be too critical because I'm very, very pro the NHL doing anything to conjure up more interest in the game here. So any sort of game like this is fine with me, but it wasn't ESPN. So we had to what have the plus membership, right. To see, I think they had a couple of the games. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I looked in on a bunch of games, but then half the time I was spent at yeah. the goalie store getting skates. So that was fun. So it sounds expensive too. <laughs> it was expensive. Okay, so I have an idea. What if instead of a frozen frenzy, they do they just go all in on Connor Bedard and do the Bedard triple header? So you could have like Blackhawks versus Tampa Bay at eleven a.m. Then Blackhawks and Dallas at three p.m. and then like Blackhawks and Devils at eight p.m. So you think it should be like a youth hockey game? <laughs> or a youth hockey like tournament where team. for yeah. some reason we think it's a great idea to have kids play three games of hockey in a day. I've always said this. There's a reason the pros don't do this. They know it's stupidity and you're just wearing down bodies and you are wearing down kids that are growing and their bodies can't take as much as a pro athlete, but no, we still do it. But that was joking. Of course. I don't, I don't, we should do it though. I like it, but it does seem like the NHL is like, in a good way, is pressing that Bedard button often and as hard as they can. Trying yeah. to like they played like two more games than anyone else right now. <laughs> yeah. they keep throwing them on national TV. So one note I did, I couldn't find any ratings information. It was a little too early, but mm-hmm. 102 goals scored on it was like six and a half average, average, right? Or six points yeah. something. Yeah. I guess I could do the math, but that's too hard. And I did see a Yahoo art. This was a kind of an interesting comparison about this. In a Yahoo article, they said that the frozen frenzy is like ESPN's take on NHL NFL red zone. Kind of right where you can pop into all these games yeah. and just watch the highlights. And so I, I think there's some merit to that. But. You know, that's, that's an interesting take because you think about the traditional NFL red zone. There's no way you can do that in hockey. You can't just every yeah. time the box in the offensive zone or every time it's not in the neutral zone, you'd have to have the camera on, but yeah, it's an interesting take. Makes sense. All right, we're going to transition to our conversation we had just a little bit ago with Mark Hill from My Card Post. And when we first got connected to Mark and learned about My Card Post, I I thought it was kind of an interesting idea. And I I was interested enough to talk to him in the concept. But it's hard to get excited about like startups. Like there's a lot of companies Mm -hmm. that come and go, and not just in the hobby, but anywhere, because we know most fail. But then I talked to Mark and 
just after kind of hearing his story and his passion and how genuine he was and authentic, uh, it made me, you know, like they say, you get interested in the person as much as the, mm-hmm. the platform. Cause Mike Harpost is not a huge corporation. He's just a guy who has, has an idea and, and a thought of maybe a better way to have a trading and buying and selling platform for the hobby and kind of been out there chasing his dream. They sponsor our pack opening videos, of course. So we've got to know him a little bit in that regard and are very grateful for that too. But it's been about six months, Troy, since we had him on and kind of first learned about MCP. And he had mentioned the other day in a message that they're coming up on their one-year anniversary. So I thought it'd be fun to have them on and kind of not just see how the platform's grown and maybe Mm -hmm. stuff that they have going on, but to get his story a little bit, that entrepreneurial journey, uh, which I, I hope others find, but I find really interesting myself and kind of what it's been like to start a hobby company and the first year and the ups and downs and trials and tribulations and that sort of thing. So we had a great conversation with Mark and we're going to roll it now. All right. We want to welcome back Mark Hill to the show. It's been about six months now, I think since we had you on and I think we're coming, you said we're coming up upon the one year anniversary of my card post. So pretty excited to talk to you uh, about that and why we wanted to have you on is I guess, learn about what's new and I guess in the past six months and then follow, continue to follow your entrepreneurial journey as a guy who just thought of a better way, I guess, to buy, sell and trade cards online and created this platform. So uh, welcome back to the show, Mark. Yeah, thanks, guys. I'm, I'm excited to be here. And it's good to, you know, have a little six month recap with you guys. So yeah. Is this the first show you've done twice? This will be the first show I've done twice. Yes. I think it was wow. my first show and now it's my first second show. Yes. Nice. We take our wins when we can get them. There yeah, we, we take yeah. our wins. Very good. You guys are doing something right. <laughs> okay. So if, if someone has not heard of my card post before or didn't catch your last appearance, give, I guess, the 30 second or minute elevator pitch. What is my card post and why did you create it? Yeah, I mean, look, my card post is a, a new marketplace concept, if you will, right? Most of the marketplaces we're used to are, are fee-based marketplaces and, you know, really ultimately come with a lot of restrictions around that model. And, you know, so I built my card post to really serve the card collecting community, the hobby in general, people like me, myself, who was having issues as I got back into the hobby. So it's, um, you know, it's all about building a community, allowing people to be themselves, to connect, build relationships, and, and really just be in a trusted secure environment where they can make any kind of deals with each other really no different than they could do on the show floor of a card show right and ultimately that was the goal i set out to in the beginning of building this and you know here we are um and we're like you said coming up on our one year anniversary next month which is just crazy to me and uh yeah it's it's been it's been an awesome ride so far so when you look back at a year ago today what what was what were you thinking like where you'd be at at this point are you about kind of where you thought the platform would be has it exceeded your expectations in some regards or not lived up to your expectations in others what was that vision like back then you know i think uh, like anyone you think it's just going to explode overnight right you're going to drop this thing and the whole world's going to think it's awesome and then you just you know you're right off into the sunset of smashing success and the reality is that's not the case um, but I would say I'm probably pretty close, like probably 60% of my expectations. I was probably a little bit more ambitious in the beginning before I launched this, but I would say, you know, just in the last couple of months, the growth we've seen, the continued, just positive feedback I get from people like every single day, whether it's email messages on social media, they're just like, I love this platform. So for me, it's just exhilarating to know that, you know, we've done something right here. We've built something that people are liking and enjoying. Um, and we'll see, I think, you know, we haven't hit our one year anniversary yet, but we're, we're pretty close to where I was, would hope we were going to be at our first year, because I did recognize that it wasn't going to be easy. The first part was going to be slow in the beginning. And this is a long game, right? This is a a long journey to, to success for a platform like this. Yes. I think for me, the key difference in my card post and most I'll call maybe traditional selling platforms is we're typically used to as collectors, whether we want to sell a card via an auction or buy it now that we're going to share some of the proceeds and pay a transaction fee. If I guess maybe if you call it that way with whatever company that we use to help sell that card. So like on eBay, it's like 13% on uh, some auction houses, it gets upwards of, I've heard of like 20% or more mm-hmm. 
now where my card post is kind of the inverse of that, where you're paying to be a part of the community and, but then you're not charged a, a transaction fee, I guess, when that card is sold. And so you, I guess on one hand, or how has, how has that been adopted by people? Have people been hesitant to pay a subscription before they technically have a success in making a sale or in a trade? Or has it been adopted pretty well, do you think, by the by the hobby? I think it goes, I think it's both. Uh, you know, I think that there's some people, and rightfully so, that, you know, there's that initial pause, like, oh, I have to pay to be here? Like, all these other places are free. You know, we all, we all know that in the end, it's not free, and it, it can cost a lot of money to do it the other way around. But I think once people get in there, they absolutely immediately see, like, wow, this is really an insignificant cost to be able to participate in a marketplace like this and to have this secure environment and to be able to build relationships with people that you're going to do many, many deals with time over and over and over again, where, you know, the model works, right? It's not um, a significant cost, especially, you know, when we talk about the subscription tiers. I mean, they start at $9 a month. So, you know, in fee savings alone, if you just moved like $80 worth of cards in a single month, the subscription pays for itself. Um, so I think, you know, yeah, there's definitely been some people who are like, oh, that the subs I don't I don't agree. I don't want to pay a subscription to to do it, to do that. And that's OK. And it takes some people a little bit more time to come around and to see like, oh, wait, oh, I, I get the value now. So, yeah, it's been a little bit of both. But I would say most people are, are absolutely like love the concept. They think it's the right path to be on. They understand that it's more serving for their needs as opposed to, you know, the platform's needs. Right. Um, you know, to be able to just pay a small entry fee to be a part of this community and then just have total freedom to make any kind of deal that they want. They can list cards however they see fit, whether they're for sale or for trade or only for trade or whatever it may be. And um, yeah, it's been it's been pretty cool. I think that the kind of like that's the marquee is sort of the fee savings, right? Like if you sell a hundred dollar card, you'll come out ahead even paying that nine dollar a month subscription on my card post. But from what all the deals that I've done on the site and as much as we've been involved through your sponsorship of our pack opening videos, and I've, I've kind of I've really grown to love it. I'm just being honest. Yes. I really love the platform. And it seems like that sort of the hidden gem or I don't know if hidden gem is the right word, but really the trading aspect is what's I think had the most popularity, especially over the past couple of months. Are you, are you yeah. surprised by that, that it's more, a little bit more trading than buying and selling right now? Or did you think that could I'm happen out of the gate? Yeah. I don't know if I'm surprised by it because I think like it hadn't existed before really, right. For the most part. I mean, there wasn't a place other than in person or, or whatever, just doing it over social media. There really hadn't been a place that, I guess organized it and, and made it, you know, a different concept and a different model where it was more safe and secure. So I think out of the gates, people were really excited about this capability and they wanted to, you know, do deals and do trades. And then, you know, as we've seen the last couple of months, the economy has gone down, the market's gone down. So people are a little bit more reserved with their cash as far as like just buying things for, for cash and having money come out of pocket. So, but I think they're prefer they want to stay in the hobby. They want to be active. They want to move cards to get new cards. So they're, you know, leveraging a lot of the inventory and assets that they already have to, you know, maybe either move into a card or maybe even trade out of a card that they feel, you know, to trade into some cards that are maybe a little bit more liquid. You know, some of the higher end cards can be harder to move in a lot of cases. You need to find the right buyer who's willing to spend that money. But maybe you want to trade down into five, you know, more liquid cards that, you know, you can move a little bit more easily. So, yeah, I don't know if it's if it's a surprise, but, you know, it's definitely people are, are loving that aspect of the platform. And it's one of the things that they think is uh, most exciting out of the gate. I think I would add to that, too, that if you have a card that you maybe spent two hundred dollars on a year ago and it's worth one hundred and fifty, where I think a lot of us are, frankly, in that situation. Yeah. That, of course, not every card. It's been a little bit tough in the economy and the, the hobby has followed suit to some person, I guess, in some regard that it doesn't feel good to sell that card you bought for 200 bucks for 150. But if you can trade it for yeah. another card that somebody else spent $200 on and is worth 150, it, it doesn't feel like uh, is you, that you're kind of throwing good money after bad at That's that right, point that, that you're able to stay active in the hobby in a tough economy. And you're able to take the full value of that card for what it is worth. You know, granted, you 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 lost value in it. If in your case, you've lost fifty dollars in value, but you can still, you know, maintain that hundred and fifty dollars value that it has, 
as opposed to selling it for 150 on a marketplace. And then, you know, in the end, you only get like 115 or 120, right? So you've mm -hmm. even lost even more value because you had to move it in a platform that didn't allow you to kind of recapture the full value of that card. And I think, you know, it just brings up another interesting point around my card post was to really kind of close that gap between buyer and seller, right? By there not being any fees and all the stuff associated, like you're buying the card for what it's listed for or what, you know, you're agreeing with, with that seller. And in a cash transaction, the seller is literally getting like 97% of the value because we do have PayPal fees, right? That's the one element for when cash is exchanged, there is a PayPal fee, but it's so much tighter as far as like what the buyer, you know, output of cash and then what a seller receives at the end of the day. And that PayPal yeah. fee, that's goods and services, right? Yeah, it's goods and services. You know, again, just, you know, another protection mechanism for the, for the community there, right? So everything uh, is done through goods and services. Okay, so I get paying a subscription, nine bucks a month, in order to go from whatever platform, uh, eBay fee or auction house fee that you have, to basically PayPal goods and services. Why? What's the benefit of paying a subscription uh, to be a part of my card post in the in the to trade? Like like, doesn't somebody just say, "Well, I can just trade with somebody on Instagram or something"? Yeah, you absolutely can. But I think, you know, the biggest fear people have is, you know, to be scammed or for, you know, there to be a fraud fraud tra type transaction. There's so much of that on social media, which is why I mean, why we see people all the time on, on Facebook, like looking for vouchers, like anything to try to like decrease the risk of a deal. It might be exciting, like, hey, someone's willing to give me X amount of dollars or someone's going to send me these cards. But, you know, there is tremendous risk around doing that on social media, which is what people don't like. So for, for me in the beginning, the subscription, you know, that was a paywall. It was a protection mechanism. You, you're in a community um, where you are yourself, right? You, you, your profile is built out with your, all your social media handles, your eBay store, your MySlab store. You know, you have all of the stuff about you. Even if you have a personal website like a podcast, you can have your own link to your podcast in your My Card Post store. So in the, in the end, it's like just closing the gap around security, um scammer reduction because you know you know the other person on my card post has also paid a subscription to be a part of this community to be able to list their cards to do deals with others and you know by having these open profiles and having no restrictions on people you know connecting on social media and all that stuff there's just so many ways for you to do that extra layer of due diligence on someone um, in addition to that paywall subscription that is protecting you Another thing I would add, because I've done like 25 or so trades now on the platform that I really like about how you built the user experience is how really easy it is to do trades on my card post. Yeah. So you basically just like you would you upload or one by one, you add listings, which are really easy to, by the way, but that's a different topic. So you have like a, a store, like a, your own page or my card post store that has all the cards that you're willing either to sell or trade with and then you can see any other members or uh, subscribers what, whatever you call them uh, their stores too so if i find a card in your marketplace that i'm interested in i can let i can propose a trade and let that person know that hey i want this is a card i'm interested in here's what i'm willing to give you but where which is all fine and, and pretty, I think, normal. But but I think where your platform gets really cool beyond that point is once that person gets that offer, who knows if they want the card that you're proposing, they can look yeah. at all your cards and say, actually, I don't want that card, but I would yeah. take these two instead. And it's so easy to go back and forth and make counter offers till yeah. you finally, where if you're doing this through Facebook, it's kind of, Oh, I don't want that card. Okay, well, when I get home in two hours, I'll take more <laughs> pictures of cards. And do you want yeah. these? No. And, and it's it's such an inefficient process, I think, otherwise, where that's... And I was never a big trader until I started using my card post. Now I'm kind of hooked on it because it's just yeah. so easy. And I've been I able to get that, some really cool cards. Yeah, and we get a lot of feedback on that. You know, Ease of use was super important in the building stages of my card post. I really wanted to just make it super simple to negotiate. And you're right, you get you get cards. Sometimes you don't know. I mean, maybe they have some descriptions or you kind of have a general idea or maybe you've done deals with someone in the past that you do know what they're interested in. But oftentimes you might not. It might be someone new. And yeah, you're throwing up like, hey, you, you have this card or these three cards. I'm really interested in them. I'm just throwing this card in here to start the, to start the conversation. 
but you know, by no means is this a final offer. Like you have the opportunity to counter, remove the card that I've offered you and then look at my page and find other stuff of interest. So very often those are how, that's how deals are starting. Like you receive an offer like, Hey, would you consider something like this? By all means, go find something else on my page that interests you more. And you know, three or four back and forths at the most. And you know, 80% of the time you're a deal's getting struck. And they, I, they tend to mushroom too. Like yeah. I, I took a, in advance of our conversation, I was looking through your transaction history on your website today. And yeah. what, one of the things that really stood out to me is a typical trade is not just card A for, I'm going to trade my one card for this other card. That's actually, it seems like the rarity on the platform. Yeah. It's usually a lot of cards. Like how, how yeah. big have some of these trades have been? We have our biggest one to date is 64 cards that exchanged hands between two people. And I, I just can't, I mean, and they did actually didn't take forever to, to nail that trade down, but you think that would be a very long process to negotiate 64 cards, but that was the biggest we've had many in the 20, 30 card ranges. And, you know, it's, it's not uncommon to see 10, 12, 15 card trades happening, you know, fairly regularly, but to your point, yeah, it's, it is kind of rare to see like one for one. It's usually a two for one or three for three or, or whatever combination it is. But yeah, it's, it is pretty cool to see the combinations of, of deals that are getting done. And the fact that, you know, you can put cash on top of any side of the deal to close a gap. You know, maybe I don't have enough cards or there's nothing else on my page that interests you, but, and we're $50 apart. It's, you know, okay, well, can I just throw $50 into this and we close the gap and, and we're done, you know? So that's another beautiful aspect of it is the fact that it doesn't have to be a perfectly matched trade value just using cards. Like you have the option of adding cash to each either side of the transaction. That's a big deal because I think that the savvy users of your platform, and as I've got to learn it, I'm really starting to understand is the flexibility. So like you said, if if a card that I want to trade for is a hundred dollar card and the, the person only wants my $80 card. I can say, well, I'll give you my $80 card plus 20 bucks and we'll get the deal done. Yeah. Or you can do like we've already talked about multiple card trades. And then on the buying and selling side, what I think, it, you know, for people, we all like to get deals, right? I mean, that's everybody. And, and the best way I think to get a deal in buying cards is whether you traditionally go to a card show or a card shop. And instead of paying, you know, $100 for a card, find $500 cards and offer the seller 450 and yeah. and then that's usually a win-win situation because they're going to trade a little bit less money in order yeah. to move more cards but you can really easily do that whole thing on my yeah. card post too where I can go to a seller's page and find six cards I'm interested in that maybe add up to that $500 and offer 450 or 475 and they can choose to accept or counter offer just like you would in a trade yeah, I think that's it's actually a, a feature that is, you know, it's getting discovered more and more by new people. And it's another thing that people are loving about my card post is that is to your point, you can, you know, go up to anyone's individual card shop, you can select, uh, you know, multiple cards from them and package them up into a single offer. So you're negotiating, you know, a single single cash price for multiple cards, which, you know, maybe they're a little bit more firm on some, but not on others. And in the end, you're getting the deal that you want and they're getting the deal that they want on, on the bundle of cards that you will. So, um, and we, we've seen, you know, sizable deals there where there's like 30 plus cards in a multi-card deal uh, where someone just, you know, purchased 30 something cards in a sh in one shot. Wow. Yeah. How many cards do you have uh, that are available to people on your platform? So the marketplace, so it's fluctuated a little bit of late. I mean, we were like, you know, closing it on, you know, 6,800 or so. There's probably 66, 6,700 cards. <laughs> I know, I know exactly what it is. 6,629. <laughs> there you go. So pretty close. <laughs> I'm, right? I'm on the site right now looking. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, it, it can it can fluctuate a little bit because, because again, like the thing about my card post is I don't have to, you know, protect the transaction and keep people here to do deals. Like they can very easily just agree on a deal offline and, and do that deal and then just delete their cards from my card post. But even if they met on the platform, right? So that that's not it. So we, we do see that where maybe people set up at a card show and they move 50, 60 cards that day and then they remove them from the platform. Um, so it's not uncommon to see it kind of go up and down on a, on a, any given day. Yeah. The, and we talked about this last 
show to your last time you were on, but I think it's worth bringing up again because it is kind of unique. And hey, we're a hockey card show, but you're a hockey card guy. And so actually in a little bit of a kind of like a bizarro world kind of thing, my card post has the most hockey cards, right? Of any other sport, which is not what anyone would ever expect looking at a sound platform. Yeah, it's still, I was talking to someone earlier today. It, it, it's come down a lot, right? It started at like 100% hockey cards. And then we got it to 90, 80, 70, you know, whatever. We're at, we're at about 61% right now, last time I checked. So, um, yeah, it's very, very heavy, a hockey card listed, you know, listings marketplace. And, you know, that's just, I mean, obviously this show, it's fantastic. But, you know, we're continuing to look to expand and, and grow those other categories and get it a little bit more balanced and, um, you know, that has been happening over the last couple of months, which is good, but it's still, there's still plenty of hockey cards of people want to make some deals. Yeah. You've creeped up. You're at 64% now. <laughs> oh man. See, someone, someone <laughs> someone pull, yeah. yeah. Someone. Or someone's putting a bunch of more hockey cards on. I see a taste. Yeah. Just All right. Well, <laughs> and that so if I, if you're a hockey, if I'm a hockey card collector and I've never been to my card post, what would I, what types of cards would I expect? Is it all low end cards do you have high end cards is it's kind of like mid range like what's the variety that you have on the platform you know it's i mean it's all of the above i mean we've seen you know Wayne Gretzky rookie cards on here you know we've seen like you know McDavid and and Ovechkin and you know so yeah there's going to be basically one dollar card two dollar cards all the way up to thousands of dollars of cards and anything in between and there's graded cards and raw cards right it's not just a graded card marketplace you can have um, you know, any raw cards, any raw cards listed. And there's, you know, collectors of all kinds in the marketplace, right? There's people that like to move, you know, one to five dollar cards and other people that are just in the many thousand dollar ranges cards. So mm-hmm. it's a little bit of everything. I, I think um yeah. I don't know. And you're you're a Boston guy, right? Right? You're I'm a Boston collector. guy. Yeah. Hey, who's who's your player that you collect? So for me, it's Pasternak for the most part, but, you know, I dabble with some of the other players too. Like I just picked up a couple of Jake DeBrusque, you know, rookie cards from, from some other, even though he's in the doghouse a little bit lately, but, um, you know, I have some McAvoy and of course, you know, Ray Bork and Cam Neely and, you know, some of the big, the big ones that I collect from, uh, from the Bruins. But, uh, yeah, my main PC is Pasternak. So send me a Pasternak trades. Okay. Uh, I don't think I have any, I maybe have a couple cards. Uh, Mm-hmm. How often are there issues? So if like, because uh, that going back to I think we we started the conversation very early on in our conversation about people's fear around yeah. well, that doesn't just exist on my card post, but anywhere you're trading when you ask for vouches and uh, of all the deals you've done, what are you doing to number one protect people? And has there been a lot of issues on individual deals to this point? Yeah. So again, I think it come it does come back to the model, right? The concept, which is, hey, we're building a trusted community of people that are paying to be a part of it. That in of itself ensures that, I mean, look, it's not perfect, right? There will never be like a 100% foolproof model. But it's pretty well proven in the first year that almost everybody in here is wanting to be a valued member of the community. And as far as issues, they've been very few and far between. Um, I mean, I personally had an issue where I shipped a card and it got lost in the mail. And, you know, what I just went and bought the card again and send it to the person again, you know, to make the deal whole. Right. Because it's not about me losing a few hundred dollars. Like That's not the important part. The important part is that we're solving problems and we're communicating with each other. And I told a story on on another podcast about um, even we share this on social media where, you know, there was another situation where the card showed it was delivered, but it was the wrong state. And, you know, they're just in, in conversation with each other, reassuring each other that, look, I'll send you your cards back and, you know, we'll, this will be OK. And I think, again, that's just a testament to what we've built is a, a strong, trusted community. The issues are very few and far between. Um, we've just introduced a new feature that allows you to report, you know, inappropriate listings or or inappropriate sellers in the marketplace. And there's like almost, you know, very few things that come out of that as well. Uh, the main things we've seen is like, hey, somebody typed the wrong name they said it's a psa 10 and it's actually a psa 9 and that stuff's minor right that's just a typo for the most part but yeah the issues have been you know again fortunately very minimal and how many people are using the marketplace now like how many uh have signed up or members do you have yeah i mean this is a record month for us we're we're probably well over 700 new members just this month alone and uh, we're closing in on 2500 members now you know that's total right of course there's a 
you know, percentage of free versus paid. But yeah, this month has been been incredible as far as growth, the word of mouth, um, you know, some of the content that's been out there on social media from others. So yeah, we're we're in the midst of an absolute record month for us and just can't wait to see what the coming months come with us as well. That made me think of an important point in that while you have to be a subscriber, you have to pay for the ability to trade or to sell your cards. Uh, a benefit is that anyone with a free account can buy. So it, as a yeah. seller, that makes your buyer pool potentially, of course, a lot bigger and yeah. uh, probably worth noting there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that we talked about that maybe last time too. It is, you know, for sellers, you want to see that there's a lot of buyers and, and granted, this is the, I mean, we're coming up on our one year anniversary. This is the infancy stage of, of this marketplace. But, um, you know, you want to have a lot of buyers who can come in there and buy cards, which again was, you know, part of the concept in the beginning was it'd be absolutely free to join. No subscription required if you just want to browse the marketplace and get comfortable and maybe just buy a couple of cards. And then, you know, maybe you decide a couple months in, like, I love this and I want to become a paid member and start selling and trading. So, and we've seen that tons, you know, every week we're getting free subscribers that are, you know, maybe they signed up six months ago, but they're just now wanting to move into a paid plan to start listing their cards. And we covered a little bit this last time, but I'm really kind of interested to hear from you in an update because I love entrepreneurial stories. I think a lot of us who are in this hobby have the dream of, listen, we're all passionate about it. We'd probably all rather spend our time thinking about the hockey cards than doing our normal day jobs and you get actually get to do that and so I'm kind of jealous i guess number one in, in that regard but how would you describe year one as being a uh, building a platform because you're not a big company i mean that's i think the other kind of really interesting thing too is we're so used to these sort of big giant corporations that launch these platforms and uh, in kind of a beautiful way, you're just a guy who had an idea <laughs> who who risked a lot because you funded yeah. every, you know, you didn't go get uh, some, you know, fanatics money or something like that to, to build this. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I'm mean, just kind of curious as to how would you describe this past year? Yeah, I mean, th there's no high. It's a roller coaster, right? It, it's been a journey, you know, right to your point. I just have built this myself. I'm just a regular dude who just, you know, bootstrapped this. And I just kept putting one foot in front of the other and one dollar in front of the other to try to, you know, try to grow this thing and build this thing and make it work and make it easy to use. And but, you know, it has its ups and downs. It's a lot of work, right? I, I you know, I have a full time job. So this is, you know, a secondary thing for me. Yeah. Um, but, it you know, they blend together and it's, you know, it's a lot of long days. There's a lot of um, you know, different elements of, of going and being on this journey, whether it being you know, trying to talk to the development team about building new features or testing new things or talking to people, um, helping, you know, explain to them why they should join my card post or help them understand how it works. And, you know, so there's a lot of stuff with social media and there's so many things, but, you know, in the end, the good days are fantastic. The, you know, the hard days when it's a little bit slow or in the beginning where it's like, we got no new members today. Or like those days, those days are not fun. But then the next day you got 10 and it was so exciting in the beginning. And and now here we are having a record month of, you know, 700 plus new members. And it's you know, it's exhilarating. It's it's a lot of fun. Um, it's crazy to think that, you know, again, me just I just built this thing. And and here we are almost a, a year into it. And the feedback I get from people is just it keeps me going for sure, because it's so exciting to see how well it's been accepted and how people just really appreciate the platform and they love the capabilities and they love the concept. So I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of work. I'm not going to lie. My wife would probably say I spend a little <laughs> bit too much time on this. Um, but you know, it's the, it's the choice I made. So here I am. What's been the hardest part. I think the hardest part is, is probably the, you know, the commitment to it, right? Because again, it's, you know, working two full, it's basically a full-time job, right? So you have two full-time jobs. I'm a father, you know, I have two, two little kids and, you know, it can, it can definitely like take you away and, and keep you a little bit, um, you know, busy throughout the day. And I think that's probably the hardest part is, is maybe just the, you know, the impact on my family life and, you know, how much time and free time I'm spending, you know, with my wife and children and not, talking to people on Instagram or something like that. So I would say that's probably the hardest part. 
What's something you know today about starting a business that you didn't know a year ago? Oh man, that's a good question. Um, I think that it's hard, you know, and, and you can't do it yourself. You need help. Um, you know, there's a lot of things you don't know. It's okay not to know. Uh, I think it's really important to think like, hey, I don't have to have a perfect business or a perfect business model or the, you know, the simplest path to success. I think, you know, just being able to to put something out there, get feedback, be transparent, right? About, I mean, I've kind of built this thing in the public. I've been sharing, you know, sharing as much as I can publicly with others and and taking user feedback and you know, we'll just, we're going on this journey together, right? This is a, a marketplace that's built for the community. So I think, you know, the biggest thing for me was like, it didn't have to be perfect in day one. I just built a minimum viable version of this. I put it out there, started getting feedback. I would fix anything that was broken. And now we're in like new feature improvement mode, right? Which is just like, how do we take this thing farther? How do we continue to serve the community and give them more of the things that they're asking for? So I think, um, you know, that's probably the biggest thing I could I could say there is just that it ain't going to be perfect. It's going to be a crazy up and down road and you're going to go in all different ways. And it doesn't have to be totally flushed out in the beginning. You can kind of learn as you go. Mm -hmm. OK, so you just mentioned that you're kind of in that new feature mode. Do you have a list of things that you're kind of working on or where do you think the platform needs to improve to take that next step? Yeah, I think, you know, so one of the cool items that, you know, people have probably seen, and if you haven't seen Mascot yet, that's another one. So Ezra at Mascot, they're, you know, they've built a pretty cool inventory management system. And I think we're, we've talked about it publicly. So we're excited for that integration to be completed between my card post and Mascot. I think that's going to be a really huge um, benefit to the platform, because I do recognize that, you know, for people that have spent years listing, you know, thousands if not tens of thousands of cards on eBay and other and these other platforms, it's hard to expect them to just like, well, we'll go list them on my card post too. do all that work twice. And, you know, that's hard for people and understandably so. Right. Um, so mascot, you know, having the ability to just sync people's inventory and then with a click of a button, be able to push it to all marketplaces, not just my card post, but, you know, eBay and my slabs and my card post and Veriswap and to have, you know, these cards in all these different places. And then for there to be an automatic like teardown of these listings as they move from one marketplace to automatically take them down from others. I think that that is going to be a pretty big game changer for everyone and make, you know, kind of the effort around listing and and removing cards, if you will. Right. Because sometimes people sell a card and then they forget to tear it down on the other ones and it sells twice. And that's a different problem. So that's one of the big ones. I think we do. have. I don't know how many I want to share, but we do have like a list of, you know, new cool improvements to the platform that we're continuing to to work on i think the biggest one that you know most everyone we probably talked about this last time too is an app right everybody wants my yeah. card post to be an app i promise i will do it um you know we're going to be starting on this soon it is one of those things where you want to have like that base of the product to be like set and ready to go and i just hadn't gotten there yet and i think we're almost there as far as like okay my card it is good it has the majority of what we would need and then we can dive into and start developing our app so i hope to have that you know early to early next year mid next year yeah i think personally as i sort of look at like maybe like how you can fit into the hobby i go back to that mascot thing and i would agree with you mark that that's a really big deal because to me what that makes my card post is not an or product so it's not an ebay or my card post it becomes an ebay and my card post because it's going to be tough i mean no offense for you to compete with ebay and the amount of eyeballs and volume that they can drive they're one of the biggest companies in the world and they have what a 25 year head start <laughs> at, at, at this point no question but if i and, and speed does matter to people that you know moving product is important if you're in a uh arbitrage business if you're trying to buy low and sell high in sports cards right and so you mm -hmm. can't discount the importance of that but if i can use a tool like mascot which i don't know a ton about at this point, is that free yeah for yeah. For, for like free. me okay yeah it's Sweet. free for you yeah so if i use mascot and and you tell me if i'm wrong but i'm just going to go off my basic understanding i can create the listing in mascot and then choose what platforms it gets published to so that That's way right. I can do one listing. It can go on eBay or some other platform Ooh. and my card post. And then if it sells on eBay first, well, then I'm sure I'll, for this 
the speed, I'll pay the 13%. But if it yep. happens to sell on my card post first, then if it's like, let's say a $500 card, then I just saved a whole bunch of money. Exactly. And you can control different price points on different platforms, you know, to accommodate for, you know, whatever the fee structure is on that particular platform. So you can have a card listed at 15% higher on eBay and then 15% less on my card post as an example, and still walk away with more money at the end of the day, right on, well, at least for my card post, right? But um, yeah, I think it's, I agree. I think it's going to be pretty cool. I, once I learned of it, it was something I, I was immediately excited about because I was thinking about having to solve this problem myself. And I was going down the path of thinking about, well, okay, well, what kind of tool can I build to help make it easier for people to, you know, one click automate their listings on my card post? Because, you know, I do recognize that that was a challenge and, and, and you're absolutely right. I'm not trying to compete with eBay. Like that would be foolish of me to try to do that. They're massive and huge, but it's, it's an or statement, right? It's around giving people another avenue to make different kinds of deals, to be able to replicate that card show experience online 24 seven, where, and especially for someone like me, right? I have little kids. I can't travel to card shows every weekend or fly across the country. And I just can't be there. And I think there's a lot of people just like me that are in that same boat, but they still want to be making deals. They still want to be doing this kind of stuff. And, you know, now you can do it from the comfort of your home. Um, like as if you were as if you were at a at a card show in person. So what what's like your ultimate vision for my card post? Do you see it as being like a huge company, like some of these big platforms, or do you think it'll always be sort of like a a, a niche but maybe mighty kind of part of the hobby? Do you have sort of like a big picture vision for what you're trying to build? I think it's to be it's to be determined. Uh, I mean. Again, it's to my other point. I don't know how how far or how quickly this will grow into something significant. Um, I do feel like we're on the right track. The trajectory is fantastic. We're growing. It's going to be a long, you know, a long road towards being a very big, large company. But I feel like you know, if you've built this thing for the right reasons and it's serving the right, solving the right problems that are for the collectors and for the community that the rest will take care of itself, right? That the community will continue to adopt it. They'll continue to invite their friends. It will get bigger. Um, I don't know. I'm, I don't have a good answer to where it's going to be. I would like for it to be a smashing success, right? And for something that I could do full-time in the future. But, um, you know, it will be a little while before that, before we get there. Troy, what, what do, you, do you have any questions for Mark? I don't have any questions, but I will... I will uh chime in with listing on your site takes about two seconds versus <laughs> ebay yeah. and all the different fields i have to go through so i i have not i'm not a power user like josh i've listed stuff pulled it down sold it on other places went yeah. back and forth but i will say the user interface and how easy it is to list on my card post i mean that's that's all i need it takes literally under five minutes if you want to do a card probably two at the most no, I mean, yeah it's very fast to list. And I, you know, again, that was always important. And it, some of that comes from just some default settings that are there that you yeah. don't have to touch, which is you don't have to do it twice. Like it's there, it's a default setting. Like you don't have to yep. worry about it. I, I will, I will admit though, I did slow it down a little bit with <laughs> you just rolled out. So now you have the, it's optional. You don't have to do it, but now you have the ability to kind of type in your PSA serial number as an mm -hmm. example, and for the cert verification link to show up in your listing. So it can take an extra three or four seconds to type that in. <laughs> Ooh. I apologize. Troy yeah. coaches so many hockey teams. I don't know if he yeah. has three or four seconds. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's super fast, super easy, right? Just take take a couple pictures, slap them in there, give it a name, and then you know choose whether it's you know raw or graded and a couple other fields, and you're done. Yeah. Uh, and then I think also, you know, again, when it's mascot, I mean you're literally gonna be like one click and boom, you're gonna push that, all I I had no, I mean, I've heard about mascot, but and you told me about it before when we were out in Burbank. And yeah. I just was kind of looking. I I didn't realize how big that or what that was doing. That seems really really cool. <laughs> like yeah. if it works, that's awesome. And I think yeah. the other thing too that is is and, and these are conversations that are happening. But like the the other thing that's really interesting about my card post is how it can serve like local card shop owners who are looking to expand their inventory or expand their deal making potential with people across the country. And you know we're seeing you know local card shops are joining in my card post and excited about its potential and you know thinking about bet more and more ideas and ways that we can serve them where you know maybe they want to have you know people in the community can send them their offers to buy like if people are buying right we see these signs at these card shows all the time like we are buying 
you know, and I feel like there's things that we could do there on my card post to really help facilitate people that want to like move their cards. Like, look, I just want to sell these. You can go to some of these sellers on my card post, whether the local sh local card shop owners or, or maybe even just individuals who is, who want to buy. And, you know, maybe they're willing to pay 80 percent of comps on my card post. And that's good enough for someone to move 20, 30, 40 cards. So I think there's just there's just so many ways where we can, you know, um, you know, just advance the platform and serve different use cases. And, and the community is awesome. I mean, I get like so many like feature ideas every day um, through Instagram or through my card post chat. And I mean, I have a long, I have a long list off to the side, like hey, great idea. I'll put it on the list. Like I can't promise you when it'll get done, but uh, I'll work on it. I like the card shop idea because when you were saying yeah. that it made me think of how like how, well, obviously local card shops are very regional, but it, it matters, I think, in the the players that are that are sought after. So here in Minnesota, most card, if there's a nice Caprice off rookie card, it's going to sell right away in any card shop. But if somebody right. brings one into those, it brings that card into their local card shop in Tampa Bay, it might yeah. not have the same desirability that yeah. that it that it would here and so if i'm a local card shop and now i can basically expand my reach to anyone in the us and canada through a platform potentially like this and say hey uh we know that we can sell and sell for good money caprice off rookies here in minnesota that's what i want to buy send me your offers but that's yeah pretty cool because basically without something like that they're kind of limited to whatever walks in their door that day. Exactly. And me in California, maybe I have a couple of Capri Softs that I want, I'm want to move and you know, you don't aren't aware of them because I'm never going to walk into your local card shop door in Minnesota. So for me to be able to like, Hey, I, I don't know. Are you guys interested in buying these? I think they could, they could move really well in your store. And again, it goes right back to this ease of use and the workflows on my card post where, you know, it can be a very quick negotiation. Like, Hey, yes, would love these, by the way, I saw these other three cards on your page. I'd like to add those to the deal mm -hmm. and I'll give you X and you can accept reject or counter. And, you know, very quickly you strike a deal and boom, you know, that card shop owner now is able to acquire inventory that, that is across the country. Yeah. I forgot. Yeah. So you're in California. You're, where are you in California? I'm in San Jose. So I'm up in the Bay area. So Northern California. Yeah. What's the local hubbub on William Eklund? Is he going to be the real deal? Uh, see, I I don't know. I'd have to ask my my buddies on the hockey team that I play with uh, more about that. I'm still, you know, still mainly a, a Boston Bruins fan, so I don't. Oh, wow. <laughs> not as ingrained in the Sharks. I mean, I'm I'm literally trying to prevent my son from being a Sharks fan. You know, <laughs> so that, that's proving more difficult enough when he's in junior Sharks hockey camp. You know, so yeah, I'm struggling there. You no, know, you just lost all your members, and uh, <laughs> there's, that, so. there's how there's how that right. goes. Well. Yeah. Uh, just a couple things I'll say to you to close out is that number one, I think you have a really cool story. What I've always appreciated you about you the most is just, and you kind of mentioned this, your authenticity, your, your genuineness, you don't kind of come on a show like ours and try to make things seem 10 times better than they actual are. You're, you're just really, you know, you, you care about this. It's very apparent and you're trying to build something that you think is going to benefit the hobby. And I think there's a lot to admire in that. And then just beyond that, you know, we really support or appreciate your support of our show and yeah. sponsorship of the pack opening videos. And uh, when Troy and I talked about starting a podcast and trying to build one and, and have sponsors, we wanted to work uh, only work with people that we really believed in and people that, uh, you know, we feel are very aligned with our values and, and as collectors. And, um, you know, so I, I definitely feel like uh, you've been fantastic to work with. And we very proudly, uh, you know, try to help you promote my card post. Yeah, you guys have done a great job. I mean, speaking of another thing, I don't that not a day goes by that I don't hear is like, oh, I heard I heard about my card post on the gong show, you know, and it's uh, <laughs> so. It's been great. Yeah, you guys do a great job. I'm happy and, and appreciative of, of the partnership with you guys. And um, yeah, it's just been great. So good luck in year two. We'll Thank keep uh, following very closely, of course. And then we'll have you back on maybe six months or a year from now and get another update on your platform, review launch, anything new. And uh, yeah, and especially, you know, I think people are going to want to know whenever that mascot integration comes to be. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully soon. And yeah, we got a lot of cool and exciting things planned in, in the coming months. So definitely, you know, stay tuned and 
and uh, yeah, and and join. You know, sign up, create your account. Again, you don't have to pay a subscription to start. You're you're more than welcome to join and and be a free member only and and just browse and buy some cards of interest or just kind of get situated and comfortable with the platform before you decide to do that. So, yeah, looking forward to it. All right, Mark. Take care and uh, thank you again for your time. Appreciate it, guys. Have a good one. All right, we're back. Thank my thanks again to Mark for taking his time to join the show. Um, I found that very informative. Did you try? I found it hugely informative, and I loved hearing. I kind of like hearing about the kind of new ideas or thought the things he's thinking about. He didn't give us all the new ideas in the in the hopper, but I like hearing that stuff. I like hearing about his story. I like will say this too. To me, the greatest thing they have going is just how easy it is to use their platform. It yeah. is so easy. It is. I love it. I love it from that, from the easy use perspective. I really like that mascot deal because I, yeah, I think cool. for, for them to be successful, it can't be a competition with eBay. Yeah. eBay is so big and it's the buyer pool is so much bigger that if it comes down to choosing, I think most people would probably choose eBay yeah. for a long time anyways, but if you don't have to choose, and it sounds like through that mascot, we should maybe talk yeah. to those guys at some point and learn yeah. more about that platform, but uh, that's really cool. So yeah. uh, congratulations again to Mark, and uh, it's pretty awesome to see him living out his uh, entrepreneurial dream. Definitely. Okay, Troy, we're going to move on to our PWCC weekly hockey preview. So PWCC is a Gong Show partner sponsor, and of course we are grateful to them uh, very grateful for their support of this total gong show that is the <laughs> hockey cards gong show the current pwcc weekly auction ends this sunday night be sure to check out the almost 300 hockey cards in the auction at pwccmarketplace.com and remember too that jeremy lee and i will be back at it this sunday night at 8 30 central time cover all the best hockey cards closing in the auction on his youtube channel sports cards live uh, again at 8 30 central time we run through all the cards, including the conditions, significance to them and the hobby, and, and comment on the closing prices. But it is, well, Wednesday for us and Thursday in the weird meta future world that <laughs> we all else are in. So it's time for us to cover and highlight our favorite vintage and modern cards in this week's PWCC Weekly Auction. So we're going to kick off like we always do with our favorite vintage cards. First one, Troy. 1961 Parkhurst. Dave Keon rookie PSA nine. I, fa I failed miserably. I, for some reason I didn't load up this one. So hold on, hold on. 61, 61 Parkers. All right. You two people. I'm sorry. Listeners. I'm sorry. Right there. Oh, there. No, I have this. Where'd it go? There it is. Yeah, there you go. PSA nine. Uh, it's a pop 26. There's only one graded higher at PSA 10. It's also a PWCC E. Exceptional IPO rating, so it puts it at the top 15% of cards for that grade. Mm -hmm. so one of the higher grades uh, for any PSA graded card. Very, very nice Dave Keon rookie card. Now, do you know much about Dave Keon? I do not know much about him, but I have read his name and some stuff about him. Just doing research on Toronto players. He comes up a lot. And yeah, who else was it? No, it was a, yeah, and, it's, he because I, I couldn't remember that he this guy played most of his career with Toronto, a lot of it. Yeah. And so every article I read with a Toronto player, he's in there somehow as an all-time great. Yep. He played 22 seasons of professional hockey from 1960 to 1982. 15 of those, like you mentioned, were for your Toronto Maple Leafs, Troy. Yep. Over his NHL career, he scored 396 goals, added 590 assists for 986 points, very close to a thousand. Yep. In 1,296 games played. Now, Troy, you've claimed the Leafs as your team. They're my team. So you, so you, you need <laughs> my to, Canadian is, team. They're my this Canadian. is something you're going to need to know. <laughs> so, in fact, he made such a mark with the Maple Leafs that in 2016, as part of their centennial celebrations, he was named the greatest player in team history. Oh, wow. I didn't know they named him the actual greatest. Yeah. Boy, that's, that's a bold statement. Very Just. Cool. That's pretty cool, though. He was a Calder Trophy winner for the Leafs in 1960-61. He scored 20 goals and tallied 45 points. Small guy, Troy, in the vein of many of today's skilled forwards. 5'9", 163 pounds. Very slight. Yep, 6'2", was Giants back then. Oh, yeah. 
He would go on to win a couple of Lady Bings in the 1962, 63, and 63, 64 seasons. Each year, he only took one minor penalty. <laughs> what? How, that's yeah. almost impossible as a defenseman. Keon is a four time defenseman. Did I just oh, he's a forward, I think. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm <sighs> it's been a long day. Yeah, that's all right. Uh well now you have to look that up because I'm second guessing myself. <laughs> Hold on, I got it. He's, he's a setter. A four, he's a setter. He, yeah. Four time Stanley Cup champion, 1962, 63, 64, 67. He did win the con smite in 1967 as well. Now, I mentioned he played 22 seasons of professional hockey. I did not say he played 22 seasons in the NHL. Mm. So here's where the insufferable Minnesotans of us kick in, Troy. After the (laughs) 1974-75 season, a little tumultuous in Toronto. The owner publicly kind of put him on blast, saying his leadership abilities was the reason why they weren't playing well. So he decided to bail on the Maple Leafs and made the jump to the WHA in the Minnesota Fighting Saints. Yeah, I love it. He played in 1975 and 1976 for Minnesota. It played well, but the, this is sad. The most notable part of his experience here in Minnesota is that in both years, the team folded twice because oh. <laughs> they, they were struggling pretty bad financially. So they played in 1975 and like with 21 games left, they folded. Then they found a way to come back in 1976 and he came back and then they folded again. Okay. I'm going to do this real quick. I love the Saints. The Minnesota yeah. Fire Saints symbol is just, or the logo. It's just awesome. It is pretty awesome. <laughs> so then after the Saints folded for the second time, he was traded to the New England Whalers of the WHA, Ooh. which then he returned to the NHL when the Whalers became one of four WHA teams to join okay. the NHL in 1979. Okay, so I want to talk about the card itself pretty briefly. It's the 1961 Parkhurst. It's his rookie, PSA 9. I really love the simplicity of this design. Uh, the, the photo is great. Like, the registration is awesome. It's got kind of a cool background where it's repeating Maple yeah, Leafs Maple logos Leafs. all in yellow. But it doesn't, like, overpower the card. It still keeps Dave Keon in the focus. Uh, of course, PSA 9, the card is in very nice condition. Uh, super crisp really everywhere left to right centering looks spot on maybe a little off top to bottom but small issue there so last sale for 1961 parker's dave key on psa 9 was in the pwcc weekly back this february when it sold for 3960 us all-time high was 5965 us dollars from the pwcc weekly as well in january of 2021 you got a current bid 775 US dollars. So, Troy, you could have uh, the rookie card of the greatest Maple Leafs player ever. Yeah, get it while it's hot. I'm guessing it won't stay that low. Nope. <laughs> nope. All right, you're up next. All right, here we go. As always, I think I just default to these, but I did 1951 Parker's Doug Harvey rookie PSA 8. And obviously, I chose to look at a 51 Parky, but the real reason was Doug Harvey is another one of those names. We kind of mentioned in the periphery, you'll read a record, Doug Harvey's name, we mentioned around there, but we never actually talked about him. And when I saw this, I was like, hmm, well, one of the greatest defensemen to play the game. It's a 51 Parky. I'm in. I'll just do this card because that makes sense. He was kind of like Bobby Orr before Bobby Orr. A little bit, a little bit, yeah, for sure. He definitely had that rush the puck kind of mentality at times. And so I thought it'd be fun to just look at Doug Harvey and talk about him in this card. And we've went over 51 Parkies. They're iconic, classic cards. I still love the look of them. It hasn't waned since we started the show and started learning about them. And I just love their overall significance in the hockey card hobby. Looking at this card, it's obviously has a high grade. It's PSA 8. And looking at the card itself on the image, card looks in really nice shape. Like the edges and corners look really, really good. The only thing is the bottom right corner is the one that's maybe a little dinged or at the bottom, but very small. Coloring looks pretty good. Now, this one is definitely getting darkened versus I've seen some other copies that are a lot, a little bit whiter. So there is that. But besides that, this card looks great. I love the red on the jerseys. Looks really, really nice. Centering's off a little, obviously, but the, the color image of Harvey looked really good. And 
just a really cool 51 Parker's card of a great NHL defenseman. So now to learn about Doug Harvey a little bit, Josh, Hall of Famer, six-time cup winner, seven-time Norris winner. Sheesh. Yeah. Ten-time NHL first all-star team, one-time NHL second all-star team, named to the greatest 100 – sorry, named to the greatest 100 NHL players in history list put out by NHL.com during the 2017-18 season for his career. 88 goals, 452 assists for 540 points in 1,113 games played. So, yes, he did have an offensive cone. He would rush the puck, but he wasn't the hugest goal scorer. <laughs> and yeah. his number two is retired in Montreal. Now, just a quick little thing on Harvey. Very interesting player. Was one of the greatest defensemen to play the game. But he also had some off-ice issues around alcohol that affected his reputation. In fact, they made him wait one year to be inducted into the Hall of Fame after he became eligible so he could clean himself up. Well, he didn't take that very well and skipped his introduction ceremony to go fishing. So he, that didn't work. He didn't, he didn't want to hear that. But, yeah, great defenseman, great player. Now back to this card specifically, PSA 8. There is – PSA has a, graded a total of 345 copies of this card with 26 of them being PSA 8s. And it looks like there's only seven copies of this card graded higher than a PSA 8. So the most recent sale of a PSA 8 copy I could find was on August 21st of this year via Heritage Auctions for $5,880 US dollars. That was also an all-time high public sale that I could find of the card. Okay. Current bid, 900 US dollars. Bye, bye, bye. It won't stay there, but bye, bye, bye. Nope. Great card. Before I get in my last vintage pick, I just got to mention, or I want to ask you about this too, but holy cow, the vintage cards in this week's auction. Tons. I could have easily picked like. 20. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, there was a goalie one I was going to do. It was one of those guys. I don't, it's one of those guys we haven't mentioned before. We have in the periphery, but I decided to land on Harvey because Harvey is an all time great. Oh, yeah. So I chose a 1984 OPG Wayne Gretzky BGS 10 pristine. And I chose this card very specifically because one of the things we really try to do on our show is provide a little bit of education of things that you would never know unless you were in this hobby long enough or talk to the right people, but could really materially change whether you like a card or not, or what you think, or maybe your perception of that card. Uh, on face value, and it is, it's a super, super nice card. It's a mm -hmm. pristine grade of a 1984 card, which is very, very tough to get. Um, and the reason probably why is because we, it's pretty clear, it's almost overwhelmingly clear that it's a sheet cut card yeah. versus one that was pack pulled. And so again, I think from an educational standpoint, it's worth reviewing again. First of all, the population count for BGS 10 is 18. There's no pristine or black labels. Uh, uh, and for those that don't know, a, P a BGS 10 pristine black label has all four subgrades. So for centering, corners, edges, and surface are all perfect 10 subgrades. This card has three perfect 10 subgrades for centering, corners, and edges, and one lone 9.5 gem mint subgrade on surface, which is one of the small clues as to why yep. it is a sheet cut card. And we'll get into that for a second. But the biggest clue or tip off as to why you would conclude this card is she cut is the corners and edges are like beyond perfect. Yeah, they're perfect. They're just immaculate. And what we know from 70s and to mid 80s is that a lot of the OPG cards that were packed into wax packs were cut with like with the wire and yeah. have what people refer to as the OPG rough cut or where the corners actually look frayed. The card, yep. and again, that's another thing that I didn't understand. Like I would, if I would have seen like three years ago, a Gretzky rookie OPG rookie with that rough cut, I would have thought the card is damaged. And I, yeah. like, Gross, I don't ever want this card, but that really is kind of the true authentic representation of that card. Uh, it's, but 
even though this card was most likely she cut, what's important to know, it, it was still produced at the same time all the other 1984 Wayne Gretzky's were produced. It just was never cut out of the sheet and packed into the cards. And so it ended up being cut at, at a later date. Now I want to get back to the subgrades a little bit and why having all pristine subgrades except the surface is another tip off. When these sheets were printed and then stored instead of being cut, they were rolled up. Mm. So very often that rolling process was a little bit of abrasion onto the surface of the card, which is why in these cases you'll see perfect corners, perfect edges, perfect centering, but a little bit lower ding on on the subgrade. Uh, and then the other kind of thing that's really important to know about OPG cards and ones that were sheet cut versus wire cut, and it's another kind of tip off or clue in this direction is PSA does not grade sheet cut cards yeah. and only Beckett does. So when you see one in Beckett and you kind of add all the clues together, it becomes pretty obvious that this was a sheet cut card. Now, does that make it bad? No. Does it make it wrong? Absolutely not. It's kind of a collector preference thing. And it comes down to, do you, to enjoy a card, do you want, and especially one that's in gem mint, do you want to have it really be perfect and be very crisp and clean on the borders, edges, and corners versus a gem mint 10 OPG rough cut card that was put into wax packs will, like I said, have a the that frame on yeah. the edges and, and corners. Um, I tend to lean, and we've I've asked this before, and I know where you stand too, uh, to be a little more of the authentic, maybe like the romance side of, oh, this card was maybe pulled out of a pack at some point where I just personally feel, and again, it's not right or wrong, that, you know, to produce this card in a pristine that somebody got a hold of the sheet and they, you know, where they say, what, measure twice, cut once. Yeah. They probably measured 64,000 <laughs> times and cut and cut yeah. once, too. It just doesn't feel as authentic to me or as natural yeah. to me. But I get it, though, too. It's like the OPG kind of, quote, unquote, rough cut, cut can be an acquired taste. Yep. Oh. And I think that, that a lot of that is it gets reflected in the value because last sale of the 1984-85 OPG Gretzky BGS 10 was this August when it sold for 1742 US. And if there is I would think that if this was a BGS 10 rough cut, it would sell for way more than that. Yeah. You? Oh, I would assume so. An all-time high, 4,440 US this past April in the PWCC weekly. Well, I got a current bit. 420 us dollars okay we're gonna switch over to modern and i think i realize i've talked about this card before but again from a educational <laughs> perspective i i kind of want i really couldn't pass it up it's a 2020 21 metal universe connor mcdavid jambalaya psa 10 it's got a pop three so there's only three of these at this grade and as we start to get more and more years of inserts like Jambalaya's, so they've come out last about three years in a row, for, and they're going to repeat McDavid every year they make one, nope. I'm becoming more and more of a big fan of what I call like the first. So if I want a McDavid Jambalaya, I instead of the 2022, which is his third straight year as a Jambalaya, I think the safest longer term play is to find, well, what was McDavid's first Jambalaya? Uh, and then so that fits the bill there. And then, of course, given it's a PSA 10, it makes it very exclusive with that pop count of three out of 28 total graded. One thing to note, though, if you're looking for a 2020 McDavid Jambalaya, is there's two versions. One was an EPAC achievement. And in the regular base set version, he's wearing a white jersey and he's wearing an orange jersey in the EPAC. I think, again, the more exclusive, Long-term value potential is going to be on the number one card, the not EPAC achievement. Those seem to, you know, people are more divided on those cards where people universally, I think, appreciate more of the cards that come out in the hobby set. So um, if I was able to choose, I would definitely choose the one in the white jersey. Like I mentioned, there are also McDavid Jambalaya's in 2021-22 and 2022-23. So, you know, we're starting to get a little crowded here in uh, the McDavid Jambalaya land, right? 
and again, it's where I go back to my concept of first. So looking at 2022 metal, 2020 metal universe, the pack odds to get any Jambalaya were one in 600 hobby packs and one in 1500 in retail, which is basically blasters. And there are 22 cards in the 2020 Jambalaya subset. So your odds to pull a McDavid were one in 13,200 hobby packs and one in 25,300 retail packs. So pretty tough chase there if you specifically wanted to rip and get a McDavid. Now, the Jambalaya is another card with its roots in the mid-90s, so the most iconic and valuable Jambalaya sports card is going to be a 1997 Michael Jordan. Yeah. So I think we're over 100,000 at some point and 50,000-ish still right about now. Last sale for 2020-21 Metal Universe, Connor McDavid Jambalaya PSA 10, 2370 on September 17th by the PWCC Weekly. All-time high, again, PWCC Weekly in June, 3480 And then there's actually two other sales of this card, both in the PWCC Weekly. <laughs> so I kind of really hope this goes to a collector. It kind of yeah. like getting flipped. It's like, yeah. this is a really kind of special, cool McDavid card. So my wish for the hobby is that whoever bids and wins this card is a mcdavid pc guy you got a current bid 260 us dollars okay try your turn all right josh before i show who this is i'm gonna take a take a step back and i did this card solely because well i'm gonna give it away i honestly don't think we've ever mentioned the name duncan keith on our show i'm pretty sure i have not and I wanted to show some love to guys that we do not talk about at all on this show. And I kind of put this note in here. I'm like, I know we get bogged down on this. On this, we both do it. We can have like McDavid's, Gretzky's, all on these Lemieux's on the modern stuff. But I'm Danny Heatley. Yep, Danny Heatley. <laughs> I'm going to change it up, and we are going to look at Duncan Keith because dang it, we've never talked about him. So I thought it'd be a great opportunity. Let's do it. So the card I'm looking at is a 2005 SP Authentic Future Watch Auto. Duncan Keith out of 999. PSA 10. The card looks absolutely amazing. And actually, it's a PSA 10. And you zoom in and, man, there's not much that you can tell from the pictures. The corners look fantastic. Edging looks great. Um, I looked at the back. Back looks fine. You know, when you got the color against the white, sometimes it'll it'll wear down or you'll see some leaking. But this looks fantastic. Card looks really, really nice shape. The red so definitely, from the Blackhawks looks really nice on those cards that year. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, one thing I noticed about the Blackhawks logo and I, is that I never knew there was blue on it for some reason. I was an idiot. I didn't realize this yellow feather had blue <laughs> in it. Oh, yeah. So I noticed that. But and then, so again, I think this card looks great. Duncan Keith, and it's got good coloring corners. I just like I mentioned. Also, I really like the auto is clean, really clean auto. Yeah. I know that's a D. I know that says Keith, and I see that's his number. I like that. Yeah, it's like not the, scribbles like we're so used to seeing. Yeah, not scribbles. It's not faded. It's not like he lifted the pen up and forgot to put it down on <laughs> some part. Looks really, really nice. So this card is a PSA ten pop of thirty two. Here you go, Josh. With a gem rate of 82%. Wow. <laughs> However, let's remember, it's 2005. These weren't probably printed to the moon. I'm guessing that pop's not changing much. Plus, let's be honest, there's not much hobby love. I don't think for Duncan yeah. Keith. But to me, it was pretty interesting to see that high gem rate. And I was making a note to myself, I guess in 2005, Upper Deck went really, really slow on the process. Make sure the cuts were just perfect for every card. Because I don't think... 82% is the highest I remember. There might be some that are higher, but that's pretty oh, high. Sh- shots fired, Troy. Oh, shots fired. That's fired. Yeah. But as I said, the real reason I did this card was to learn more about Duncan Keith. So here we go. Three-time cup winner, two-time Norris winner, one-time Con Smythe winner, two-time NHL first all-star team selection, one-time NHL second all-star, all-star team selection, four-time NHL all-star game participant. Here's the one that I completely forgot or blew my mind named to the greatest 100 players in nhl history list wow. i didn't know that it it makes sense he was a great d-man but once it's one of those guys where you look at his stats you're like huh 
Because here's his stat, here's his career stats. Again, remember defenseman. 106 goals, 540 assists for 646 points in 1,256 games played. But longevity, cups, Norris, it makes sense. It's just one of those guys I kind of forgot about. Half a point a game guy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Nope. And then when I was researching him for this little short bio, (laughs) this is my favorite. I love this story told by Duncan Keith's dad. Way back when we were still living in Fort Francis, we went to Minneapolis for a squirt tournament. Interesting. Or they played five games in a day. David <laughs> Key, Dave Key said, kids from all over the world, including Russia, Ilya Kovachuk played for the Moscow Selects and scored four goals. Duncan's team lost seven to three, and he was so crushed. So he said to me, we have to move to Russia so I can get better. <laughs> I told him, son, we are not moving to Russia. <laughs> Probably a good call there, Troy. Good call, but I love that. That yeah. and there's a lot about Duncan Keith kind of being a uh, workout freak, like doing everything he can. He was determined from the day he was like, like eight years old to play professional hockey. If you read the bios about him, and he made it happen. Again, great player. I loved researching about him. Loved looking up this card. Really nice card. I really like the look of this card. Most recent verified sale of this card I could find was on October 11th of 2022 via C or via eBay.ca and verified in therapy was for $301.75 US. Current bid is 56 US dollars. All right, this last card I'm great very, card. very excited about. Yeah, and great I, card. And I'll admit it, I picked it for kind of obvious reasons at first, but then was blown away with really what I would consider the history of this card. Yeah. So I'm talking about as a 2013, the cup Wayne Gretzky and Mario Lemieux signature renditions, auto out of 50 it's raw, but NBA authenticated like all the raw cards are in PWCC yep. marketplace. It's a re- it's an interesting card too. It, it, for a lot of reasons, but it's significant that it's a dual auto of Gretzky and Lemieux, of course, but it's unique in that they're both in team Canada uniforms. Mm-hmm. And one thing that I really appreciate about this card is that and very uncommon in like dual auto cards is it both it p- features both pictures of Gretzky and Lemieux, but it's the same photo. So they got when they were on the ice wow. together yeah. and that kind of makes it awesome in and of itself, but it gets way better. So the image Troy is from the 1987 Canada Cup. And here's something that's really incredible and significant about that. It was the only tournament where Gretzky and Lemieux played on the same line. Hmm. Gretzky ended up being the tournament MVP with three goals and only 18 assists. <laughs> and Lemieux led the tournament with 11 goals and added seven assists. Oh, controversy there. Holy cow. So all his, I wonder if, if Lemieux, all his goals, <laughs> Gretzky assisted on. Well, Lemieux is like the dry sidle. Yep. There you go. Right? He wouldn't be that good if he wasn't playing, <laughs> playing Gretzky. So Canada in this tournament, Troy, featured 12 future Hockey Hall of Famers on their roster. Have there even been 12 Hockey Hall of Famers from the <laughs> United States? No, I know there. Yes, there has. They would go on to win the tournament. They beat the Soviet Union in the finals in a best of three series. Now you got to remember, too, at this time, players from the Soviet Union were not allowed to pursue careers in North America. So it's one of the few chances that fans and players got to kind of test playing North American talent versus people from the USSR. Uh, in the tournament, Troy, the USA failed to make the elimination <laughs> rounds. Uh, yeah. Shocking. Shocking. So this card is like just a million things going for it. It's got tons of history, right? The only time they played together on the same line in a, in a tournament they're in the same image, which oh. I think is really an awesome feature of this card. Because normally you'd see like a headshot of each. It's a photo of both of them on the ice together at the same time in a game. It's a cup card. So that's always a bonus. Yeah. Numbered out of 15 makes it very elusive. Hard signed autos, which you would expect with the cup. But it's got the nice touch of the gold ink auto as well. A horizontal card, which... I know we typically don't prefer, but there would be no way to get them. Yeah, I, I can make an exception if it's this card. Yes, for this card. 
the condition's not perfect. The corners are have a little bit, but yeah. the card is in good enough shape. This is, in my mind, a special card. This is a card that, and the, not every card does this, of course, but in some few cases that kind of crosses over into that, it's, it feels like as much of a piece of history as it does just a hockey card. And whoever came up with this idea at Upper Deck at the time yeah. to create this card, uh, I'm sure it was work maybe to put together, but it's awesome. The concept is just amazing, and I love it um, and really, really want it. So the only public sale ever on this card for 2013-14, the Cup Gretzky Lemieux Signature Rendition Autos out of 15, happened to be this exact same card. This yeah. is numbered 5 out of 15. It sold for $616 US, but way back in October of 2014. It ain't going for $616 this time, I don't think. I would do that in a heartbeat yep. today for this car. Yep. Uh, current I got bid, excited when I saw that, and then I saw the year. I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. You got the current bid, Troy? $165 US dollars. So do you love this card as much as I do? Oh, yeah. I would definitely bid on this if I could afford it, but I'm assuming it's going to get out of my price range pretty quick. Yeah. Okay, now what? It's been like a week, a week plus since Series 1 has been out. And mm -hmm. last week we kind of looked at, from like a base Young Guns perspective, tried to rank who the biggest chases were. And we had mentioned at the time that one of the things we're excited to track is we've, with the new configuration in Series 1, we've got all these new cards. We've got the Young Guns Deluxe. We've got all the Outburst Parallels. And at this point, I think have enough information, maybe not to draw complete conclusions, but to at least get a basic understanding of where the values are going to shake out on some of these new cards. And so spend some time this week looking in to sales for 2023-24 Series 1. And kind of, we're going to kind of go through each of the parallels quickly and kind of where their values are landing in relation to each other. And to do that, I use the four biggest chases from our last week episode. So Matthew Nye's, uh, brother, Luke, Luke, Hughes, brother Luke. Uh, Jedi master, Devin Levi and Yaroslav Askarov, who we don't know what his kind of cool gimmick is yet, but I'm sure he's getting one or he's going to have one. I have to say this too. You blew our whole production budget on these graphics. These are really nice. Oh, really? You like them? I like yeah. them. Uh, I the whole time I'm doing it, I'm like, why am I spending hours on <laughs> something like this? But uh, it was fun to go through and look at the data. All right, Troy, we're going to start with Matthew Nyes. And the first thing I did is I did kind of an update on his average sales value for his Young Guns base. I looked at the last five sales. So that's currently coming in at $42.88 US. Then we get into the new stuff. So we start with the Outburst Silver, where the last five sales average here is $116.78 US. So that's a 2.7 times multiplier over his base young guns. And I think that's one of the key questions, especially with these outburst silvers, is how do we value these? Yeah. Like when we get one, how do we figure out if it's, you know, we know it's going to be more than a base, but to what degree? And so this is just Matthew Nyes. And one of the things that'll be interesting to see is how this holds through the other players we look at. Then you look at his... Young Guns Deluxe. Remember, this is the new parallel out of 250. So there's been exactly five sales here. So we could do a five sale average of 231.27. That's about a 5.4 times multiplier over his base Young Guns. And then his clear cut Young Guns, looking at the la the first five sales there, has a five sale average of 251.83 US, about a 5.9% multiplier. So, like I said, just looking at Matthew Nye's, the couple things that stood out to me at least are, you know, I don't know what to make of it, but a 2.7 times multiplier of the Outburst Silver. And then the fact, Troy, that the Young Guns Deluxe out of 250 and the clear cut are kind of in the same ballpark from a value perspective. Yeah, I think that means people don't know what to do with that clear cut. <laughs> and the Because that Deluxe, I mean, at least you know it's out of 250. Clear cuts, I can't remember yeah. their odds or we don't know it. We just think they're really short printed. But and yeah. clear cuts established and so has a yeah. long history of people really understanding kind of what the value should be. Well, let's go on to Luke Hughes now and see if we kind of got similar results. And we're going to recap this all when we're done too. Yeah. So an updated last five sales average of Luke Hughes based young guns is $38.74 US. His outburst silver last five sale average is 109.80 US. 
which is about a what's that a 2.8 times multiplier there and there's been only been three sales we can't do five sale average of his young guns deluxe out of 250 but that's at 245.98 so about a 6.4 times multiplier and then looking at his last five sales for his young guns clear cut is average is 403.32 us 10.4 time multiplier so here is a case where people are spending a lot more on his clear cut than his uh young guns deluxe out of 250 which is kind of interesting note and then there's been one um sale of his exclusives out of 100 for 573 us which is about a 14.8 times multiplier over his base and then we talked about two the last show there's been one of his outburst red out of 25 that sold for 9 uh 52 but just one sale there no yeah. high gloss have sold to date so again another quick example and i think this is all going to kind of make the most sense when we kind of recap and show everyone together yeah. but i just want to go through the data for people so we'll go very quickly through devin levi and yaroslav askarov so levi last five sale average for his base young guns 32 dollars 92 cents then you go out to Outburst Silver, last five sale average, 91.06. So a 1.8 or 2.8 times multiplier for the Outburst Silver. Pretty in line with what we're seeing for both Matthew Nyes and Luke Hughes so far. His. Now, this is a kid. No, this is kind of yeah, weird, this right? This is crazy. Where, last five mm-hmm. sales uh, average for his Young Guns Deluxe, 171.36, 5.2 yep. times multiplier over base. Now, in both cases so far, Matthew Nyes and Luke Hughes, their clear cuts have been selling for higher than the deluxe. In this case, though, in the case of Devin Levi, his clear cuts, and there's been a bunch of sales, his last five sales have averaged 79.28 US, only a 2.4 times multiplier. So that might tell me that if you can get a, if you believe in Devin Levi, you want to collect him, you think he's a good investment opportunity, whatever your reason for collecting him is, that there's a lot of value right now in his young guns clear cut because it's at least compared to Hughes and eyes, it's way cheaper on proportionally. And then there's been one young guns exclusives out of a hundred sale, 280 us. So that's a 8.5 times multiplier over his base young guns. And then the last guy we kind of looked at individually is Yaroslav Askarov last five sale average base young guns, $21 40 cents us. Only four sales of his upper silver, but the average there is 67.50 US. So that's about 3.2 times multiplier over his Young Guns base. And Young Guns Deluxe out of 250, there's been two sales, average of 76.64, a 3.6 multiplier. So maybe a little bit of value there mm-hmm. if you can get one in that range. Um, two sales so far in a clear cut, average $100.37 US, three. 4.7 times multiplier there and then one sale for an exclusives out of 100 225.55 us which is a 10 and a half times multiplier there okay so that's what we looked at each of these guys individually and now i think we kind of get to the meat of the conversation where probably easier to see on youtube where you can see the chart in of itself but we kind of put all this together and so i'm going to go just looking at the multipliers because that's sort of like how it evens out so for the upper silver we had 2.7 times multiplier 2.8 times multiplier 2 times 8 multiplier and 3.2 so there, there is at least a general consistency yeah. you're a data guy right so that points you that um at least directionally at this point that mm-hmm. that you know and so what are some of the takeaways out of this i mean maybe now is a good time to get into that it's early. We don't yeah. know. This yeah. still has to shake out. But in looking at this kind of data, Troy, what I would think today that if I want, am really interested in an outburst silver young guns, I'm probably targeting like 2.8 times multiplier. Yep. is probably a fair rate. Yep. So if somebody wants to charge you 5x what his base young guns is yeah. going for, yep. you don't pay that. Yep. And if you think you should pay one and a half times, expect the seller to say no or the trader to not agree to the trade. Then looking at the deluxe, it's again fairly consistent. Mm-hmm. Where you have 
and deluxe set 255.4 times multiplier 6.4 times multiplier 5.2 times multiplier and 3.6 times multiplier so right around probably like a 5.2 would be the average for for deluxe and this is where we talked about too where one of the things that really stands out to me is sort of how deluxe out of 250 and clear cut are in the same ballpark so clear cut was 5.9 times multiplier 10.4 times multiplier 2.4 times multiplier and 4.7 I think that, if you average them out, they're actually again pretty close. Is it? So that Levi thing is a little weird. I'm wondering if those were like buy low buy it nows or something. Like what? I don't know. I mean, it's yeah. initial sales. It's you know, I, I think like you made a really good point a couple minutes ago where these new cards come out and people don't even know what to price them. So <laughs> somebody, now the guy that threw out a Matthew Nye's Young Guns exclusives for a hundred dollars fixed price. Yeah. He obviously yeah, didn't. <laughs> you should probably you think you would know a little bit better by yeah. now, but if it's an outburst silver or a deluxe, um, you don't know. Uh, I just find it really interesting that in a lot of these cases that we're still valuing the clear cut over the number. Kind of kind of to your point. Yeah. And then there's pretty common on exclusives, right? Where you had three of the players yep. that had an exclusive sales, it was a ten and a half times multiplier. An eight and a half times multiplier and a ten and a half times multiplier, right? So right at probably nine point two five or whatever is the average there. And then we've only had one Opus Red, so it's hard to draw too many conclusions. So what are your takeaways? Again, I don't know. It's super early. I don't think you can say anything very definitively at no. this point. But to, you're like I said, you're the data guy. So if there's any takeaways you have today, what I, would those be? I mean, it just gives me an early indication what the hobby is thinking right now. However, you're going to need 30. I think you would really need 30 sales to start seeing maybe a little bit of trending. Plus, it's weird because we got another variable, right? Actually, how these guys are playing yeah. <laughs> with time is also going to affect this. So that will be interesting to see how that kind of happens. But yeah, once you get more sales, you'll see this kind of, I don't know what will happen, like where they'll go and move, but it's an interesting trend just to start. Well, we'll keep following it. and. Uh... It's awesome, though. I mean, it's kind of fun to have new stuff to sort of digest and look into and figure out versus how, the I guess, the same old, same old that we're used to. I mean, save these numbers, right? Save these numbers and we'll look in a couple months and see what it's doing. Probably be different, but Mm -hmm. as we know, it gets a little wonky right when a new product comes out. Yep. Very brief new product releases segment. Just a couple things. Reminder that 2022-23 SP Authentic releases November 1st. So that'll be next Wednesday. And then, Troy, I don't know if you, oh, you might have maybe told me this, but 2021-22 Synergy as of today, Wednesday, and definitely Thursday. Oh, yeah, EPAC. Yeah. Bill on EPAC. So I checked this morning, 93 US a box. Now, Again, with EPAC, Ooh. you don't get the physical box, but there are achievement cards that you can, I guess, well, achieve via <laughs> collecting or trading on the EPAC platform. So it looks like there's like a black auto parallel. And then there's a number of, and I really like these cards, cast for greatness parallels that include auto. So those are maybe a little bit of the different wrinkle that you will get on EPAC. But here's what's kind of really, I don't know how to think of this. Is So... 2021-22 Synergy debuts today at 93 US a box in EPAC. If you're in the US, you can get it for 55 bucks a high. Buy it online. On Dave, on Dave and Adams. Buy it at Dave and Adams. Like or half. Steel City. Half. And you get all well, the night. Yeah. Unless you really love those achievement cards. Yeah. I mean, you're going to definitely pay a premium. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're going to end the show with personal pickups. Uh, like I always do, you go first. All right. So I don't have pictures of these. I'm going to hold it up. But I got a sweet 2022-23 trilogy. Matt Zuccarello with the Wild. Base black foil memorabilia patch auto out of 25 from a listener. So thank you very much. Is it Braun? B-R-A-U-N-E. I really appreciate this. It is going right into my display case of Minnesota Wild players. Again, we say this all the time. I'm actually blown away. Anyone would send me anything or us anything. It, it, it's very much appreciated. And again, not needed at all. Please listen, watch our show. And if you feel compelled, join uh, join the Patreon. But you do not need to send us stuff. But I really appreciate this. And I love this card. Patch is awesome. Auto's off, awesome. 
And it's an awesome card. And yeah. Very, very gracious or very, very nice gift. And then I talked about these already, but I just want to show. I got them in hand. I got my from Slab Sharks, my Miko Koivu auto. And then nice. oh God, I'm trying to go reverse and my Bernie Nichols one. There we go. Out of stature. So got these in hand. They look awesome. Going in my cases. I love it. There you go. I had one personal pickup since last show. I did another trade on my card post. Just talked to Mark today. So I guess very timely in that regard. Got a card that I'm really pumped about, Troy. It's a 2022-23 Metal Universe Kaprizov Hot Numbers insert. I love anything Kaprizov, and I love, <laughs> love anything in the reverse retro jerseys that yeah. have our old North Stars colors. So uh, very cool. Now, if you're not familiar, these hot numbers are lenticular cards, so they're the cards that kind of move yeah. and have motion. If you sport twist flicks, that's them. all I can. That's yeah. all I think about sport flicks. And it's kind of a quote unquote new insert for 2023, 2022, 23 Metal Universe. But the card, of course, is not brand new. It dates back to flare sets in the mid 90s. Okay. And uh, many might be already familiar with like hot numbers would associate with like a 1996 Gretzky. Hot numbers from Flair, kind of a cool card there too. Uh, what Upper Deck did though with this Kaprizov and all these with kind of the yellow background is made it much more colorful. Like if you go back and look at all the different Flair or Hot Numbers cards to date that were all had that lenticular component, maybe a little more muted when they were originally produced. In the, I know in the like I said in the nineties, and I think there's maybe a set in two thousand seven. The first hot numbers was in 94, I believe. Oh, 2007, Ooh. 2008. The player did it as well. So they brought back this card for 2022, 23 metal universe. Again, made it much more colorful. And I, I just really like the the design. And I had to hit one of these uh, because of banish ad in a box. Oh, nice. So nice. yeah, I've seen them in person. Now they are considered a case hit. They're pack odds of one in 240. 35 players on the checklist for hot numbers. So to specifically pull a Kaprizov hot numbers would be one in 8,400 packs. So pretty tough. Uh, again, cool. got a trade on my card post. So really happy with that. All right, Troy, that's our show. If you like the episode, please leave a rating review on Apple, Spotify, whatever podcast app you listen to us on. If you love the show, you want to support us, want to chat with us every day on the Hockey Cards Gong Show Discord server, Please consider a $5 a month donation. Join our on a $199 support level tier on Patreon. The link is in the show description if you're listening to us on a podcast app or in our YouTube description there. It's on our website if you go to hockeycardsgongshow.com and click on the Become a Patron link at the top of the page. You can go to the Patreon website directly, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, and search for Hockey Cards Gong Show, or it's in our Instagram and TikTok profiles and our link tree thing there. We are on social media. We're on Instagram. Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. And Troy, the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast is a production of Dollar Box Ventures, LLC. Have an awesome rest of your week and a great weekend, and we'll chat with you all Monday.